to open the door. Matters of privilege and recognition of guests, the Honorable Premier. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and welcome back to my colleagues for another day in the provincial legislature. Welcome to those who have joined us in the public gallery and those who are joining us uh, online uh, on Eastlink or on our social media platforms. Uh, I want to begin, Mr. Speaker, by saying yesterday in my greetings, I had suggested that there was an announcement coming from the Guild next week. Uh, I guess the days all run together for a lot of us in here, and actually I was part of the uh, announcement of the Summer Festival 2022 of the Guild this morning, Mr. Speaker, uh, and I was a great, uh, it was a great event, great to be there. They have a really exciting season coming up, uh, uh, which includes Steel Magnolias, uh, uh, again offering tapestry, a tribute to Carol King, uh, a really unique and interesting, amazing looking uh, debut uh, of a show uh, called The Two Horsewomen, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and one that I'm most excited about uh, is uh, Dance Mix 95, Mr. Speaker. Uh, back when I was a little slighter, a little more uh, agile, I could be seen uh, dancing around the floor to some of these songs that they were playing. And I look forward to uh, doing it again, Mr. Speaker, this uh, coming summer at the Guild. So to Alana and the Board of Management and all the staff, and Jordy Brown, uh, thanks for, for that, and I look forward to a great, uh, a great uh, summer festival season. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I do have a bit of a heavy heart uh, in recognizing the uh, uh, pa passing far too soon of Dr. Rhonda Matters, uh, uh, PEI's first uh, Chief Mental Health and Addictions Officer, a real champion of mental health and addiction services in PEI and was responsible for developing uh, PEI's mental health and addiction strategy that was released in 2016. Uh, and not surprisingly, Mr. Speaker, there's a memorial fund set up for youth mental health uh, initiatives uh, in uh, Dr. Matters' uh, honor. And I just wanted to pass along on behalf of all Islanders our sympathies to Alan and all of her family and all of those who Dr. Matters touched in her brilliant career here in Prince Edward Island. She's uh, she will be missed greatly, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I also wanted to say at the Guild this morning, I ran into uh, my friend um, Julie pellissier Lush, who everybody knows is our Poet Laureate. Uh, and she's having a book of poetry release uh, next Wednesday at the, at the uh, Florence Simmons Performance Hall at Holland College, Mr. Speaker. And we had a great little visit. Uh, when I worked at the Mi'kmaq Confederacy, Julie worked there. Uh, and uh, through our work together, I realized she had uh, written a book called My Mi'kmaq Mother, uh, and I helped her publish it. And she reminded me today that I was the MC of that book launch. And uh, she didn't ask me to MC the poetry book launch, but she asked if I would go and uh, offer a few words of, uh, of thoughts and thanks, and I would be honored to do that. Uh, just an exceptional individual uh, who happens to be uh, um, uh, a member of the District 15, which I represent, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, so I'll gladly go there and I encourage all those to, uh, uh, to attend and support this uh, book of poetry that uh, Julie uh, will be launching. And finally, Mr. Speaker, uh, if today is the last day of the legislature, which we're not sure, I do have an obligation to, uh, uh, to share uh, some brief details of a major announcement that's taking place tomorrow. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and I wanted to congratulate BioVectra under the leadership of Oliver Tetchnell as uh, they prepare to make a major announcement tomorrow morning with uh, Minister Champagne, Minister, who is the Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry. Uh, I can't say much more than that, but I do have an obligation when the House is in session to make the legislature aware of uh, these announcements before they're made to, Mr. Speaker, in a public forum. Uh, so I would encourage everyone to keep their eye out uh, for tomorrow. It's an announcement that is uh, 11 or 12 months uh, in, in, the, in the making, Mr. Speaker, and it's one that I think will continue to change the face of the bioscience industry in Prince Edward Island. So uh, if I've tickled your interest far enough, Mr. Speaker, that's as far as I'll go, but I just wish all of my colleagues a productive day here in the legislature. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to start today by recognizing some guests in the, in the gallery. I see Karen Lips over there. Lovely to see you, Karen, and Bethany Collicut McNabb, both of whom I would have expected to see in the early days as soon as we were able to open this up. And I hope my tie is satisfactory today, Bethany. Thank you. Uh, I would like to mention uh, a little bit about Do Dr. John Van Leeuwen, who has recently awarded the Rotary Club of Charlottetown Royalty Mentor Award. And John is a professor at the Atlantic Veterinary, Veterinary College, and along with students from the ABC, he's traveled to, to Kenya, I think, almost 30 times um, through Vets Without Borders and through Farmers Helping Farmers. And in his work there, he's done research um, and international development projects on the health of dairy cows. And through his work, He's made an enormous difference in the lives of thousands of farmers, both here on Prince Edward Island and also in Kenya. So congratulations to John for that really well-earned award and for his ongoing work and mentorship that he provides here in Prince Edward Island and beyond. And like the Premier, I would like to send my condolences out to the family and friends and many admirers and colleagues of Dr. Rhonda Matters. She was a longtime resident of Kelly's Cross in my own district, and she died just this past Monday, Monday uh, in Charlottetown from lymphoma. And Dr. Matters was a huge contributor here on Prince Edward Island to mental health services, to education, to governance, to the policy development, both in this province and actually nationally. And she was, as the Premier said, she was the province's first director of mental health and addictions. And her legacy is going to continue to, through the work that she's done and the huge positive impact she's had on so many islanders who have struggled over the years with mental health and addictions. And when it comes to mental health, particularly our children here. So my deepest condolences to Alan, her husband, and again, her family and many admirers and colleagues and friends here across the island. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I too would like to welcome everyone back today, and I'd like to welcome our guests in the gallery and the media back again. And Mr. Speaker, I also would like to express my sympathy to the Matters family on Dr. Matters' passing. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, uh, as indicated, we may end the House today if we do, I guess, by the look of the agenda, we've got a lot of work to do. So I look forward to deliberations and uh, working together with our colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's uh, great to rise here today and, uh, and bring greetings. I want to say hello to my mother who watches uh, every single day. She's noted that I don't get much time on my feet in here, so I figured I'd take the opportunity to at least say something in greetings to her. Um, and I want to, because uh, I didn't have a chance earlier in the week, I, I do want to welcome back the, the media to, uh, to the chamber. It's, uh, the configuration is is different, but it's a little bit more comfortable to what I've been accustomed to over my years here. <clears throat> and speaking of the media, Mr. Speaker, uh, every Wednesday morning, and faithfully, I read the graphic. It's the first thing I do on Wednesday morning, most particularly to see what Paul McNeil said and to determine whether or not I have to call and argue with him on my drive to work that morning because of his, uh, his opinion. But um, I took special note of an article that was in the paper today, and it's why I I decided I'd, I would bring greetings today and I'd like to talk about it. In 2017, um, the Liberal government tried to close our school in, in Georgetown. And uh, for those of you who were here at the time, it was, it was quite a battle. And the community stood up to, uh, to the government with quite a battle. Uh, um, you know, people like Stacy Toms and Mallory and uh, uh, Peters. <laughs> Mallory Peters and Melvin Ford. And there was, there was a great group of people who really came together and fought really, really hard to, uh, to secure their school, and they, and they won, which is fantastic. <clears throat> I remember saying at the time to the government, you know, we need an opportunity to grow. You can't just say that your numbers say in 2022 that they're going to be 49. So the, the government said, in 2022, the number's going to be 49. And I said, it's your job to, to make that not so. It's government's job to make that not so and to invest in communities to give them an opportunity to grow. So in today's article, they talked about the current year enrollment is, is 75, which is, which is fantastic. 
that's a lot higher than, than the number that was projected in, in 2017 to, to happen. Um, and it's a, it's a testament to a, a community that's growing, that's changing. When you drive through there in the afternoon when school lets out, there's children everywhere walking home from school or biking home from school or playing in the, in the playground or playing basketball or soccer, and it's fantastic to see. And, uh, and I think there's still an opportunity to grow through uh, housing in the community, which is something that I'm actively working on with community members. I think there's an opportunity to grow jobs in the community that I'm actually working on uh, for my constituents. And I think that we know when government gives up on a, on a community, it's a terrible thing. And, uh, and I, wanna, I wanna give a shout out to those people who fought so hard to save their school, to save their town, and look at where we are now. Thank you, Mr. Well, Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Brighton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, welcome to my constituents from Brighton who are listening online, and of course, welcome to my wife and far better half, Karen Lips, and um, who's joined the gallery and uh, she's one of the very few people I actually recognize with a mask. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> the Charlottetown West Worthy, third party house leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just uh, rise and say hello to everybody in District 14. And, and uh, just, just two things really that this month, November, is uh, it's an important month. And sometimes there's, there's a lot of different months for a lot of different things. But uh, this month is Falls Prevention Month. And uh, if anybody has, has family members, aging family members or anything, you have to be careful. And this month is all about kind of trying to make sure their house is safe and you know what a fall can do and just make sure that, that we have that discussion and, and make sure people are stable because um, it, it's so important. I've done a lot of work on this file and, and I just want to remind everybody of that. And as well, um, if we do close, um, I just wanted to maybe say if, uh, just a couple things on uh, the upcoming uh, Purple Ribbon campaign. It's, uh, it's a very important campaign to end violence against women. And on December 6th, um, the, the, the ceremony will be, will be taking place to remember that and about the 14 women that were murdered in, in the ACOL Polytechnique and as well as the, the Islanders that we've lost to, to violence against women. So uh, I think those are, that's an important campaign at this time of year. So I just wanted to rise and, and say a few words on that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm uh, following on from the Minister of uh, Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Um, I also need to shout out for my mum who watches every day. In fact, she rushes to get home so she can tune in on time. So, hi, mum. I am on my feet more often than you, I think, Minister. Um, but the other thing that the Minister reminded me of uh, was um, a book that we actually shared comments on a couple of years ago. You might remember um, when you were on this side of the house. It's 13 Ways to Kill Your Community. And we had such a good conversation around that. And one of the key things in that was about the importance of a school a coffee shop, um, small business, housing. And I think of that whenever I'm in Georgetown, I go and get like ridiculously inappropriate treats from uh, the Roman Pig and don't tell my, my, uh, my doctor. But, um, but it, it, is, it, it's, it is absolutely about the core of what, what builds a vibrant community. And, and yeah, absolutely, you know, that, that book is kind of a guideline of how we ensure that we support our rural communities. And it's something that I keep coming back to when we talk about what we need to do to make sure that, that our, our way of life is thriving here outside the urban centres. Um, the other quick thing, uh, Mr. Speaker, that I just wanted to recognise is I have a, a couple of friends who are working with um, um, Air Search and Rescue in British Columbia at the moment. Um, um, I spoke to one last night online um, who has just come off a 30-hour shift doing uh, ground support. Um, it is an incredibly difficult and stressful time out there right now. Um, there are, it, it is a crisis that you can't imagine. I think we're going to see really long repercussions to that. And I really want to sort of, you know, be mindful of how challenging those situations are. They're not just news stories. It's real people who are being impacted, real impact that we're going to see around here. It's a real impact of climate change, Mr. Speaker. Um, and when you talk to somebody who's, who's actually doing the day to day in there, it really brings it home. So it's my thoughts are with, um, you know, those who are putting their lives on the line to help others keep them safe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I thought I'd just rise as well as uh, my Honourable Member talked about the threat of school closure a few years ago. Uh, Belfast <laughs> was at 98 students, and I just got uh, the, the news that we're at 157, wow. and Monday we'll be at 159. So, so it does 
show you uh, about you know supporting your communities. We have a new coffee shop. It, it's it's just a wonderful thing, and there are a lot of new fam families have moved in. Uh, it's so good to see, and we have uh, childcare there now, early years center, and I think we're at about 27 students, so or 27 uh, children. So it's it's all a very good story, and I think uh, Alan Lumber talked about Mount Stewart to me, and and how many of these rural schools are now increasing in numbers. I also want to do a little public service announcement just in case we close the house this, this week. Um, uh, we're going to have Christmas in the Villages in, the, in Murray River, Murray Harbor. Uh, it's the December 4th weekend, so please uh, come out. There are wonderful uh, ch uh, lobster croissants and chowder, and uh, they don't. no one does lobster better as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> we had a wonderful lobster supper from down there uh, two weekends ago. And also there is um, the Belfast Historical Society will be having a craft fair on November 27th at Belfast Rink. And uh, just so you all know, um, the Minister of Finance will be crafting and presenting her crafts there. So please come out. Yep, yeah, uh, it's something I do to keep myself sane. And uh, I'll be happy to be, be there and support uh, the Belfast Historical Society. So I hope we all have a great day. Thank you. Honorable Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning, Minister responsible for the status of women. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's certainly a pleasure to rise today. Hello to everyone in our gallery, and hello to the media. It's nice to nice to see you back, and hello to everybody tuning in uh, from District 9, Charlottetown, Hillsborough Park, Mr. Speaker. Last night, I also I uh, actually had the opportunity to participate in a uh, in the Duke of Edinburgh Awards at Ecole Francois Viot in District 9, and Mr. Speaker, I wanted to say congratulations to all the award recipients last night, Mr. Speaker. The uh, Her Honor Antoinette Perry uh, was there. Uh, handing out the awards and Mr. Speaker my goodness the energy in that room uh, with our youth it certainly was a pleasure to, to participate Mr. Speaker and again uh, congratulations to all involved and Mr. Speaker I also wanted to uh, to say congratulations a, uh, to Jay Baglow and uh, and Sonia Hooper Mr. Speaker this past weekend uh, they were awarded the uh, Educating with Excellence and Leadership Awards uh, by the Early Childhood Development Association and I have the privilege of, of getting to to know Jay um, as uh, they work at uh, Tiny Tots and Mr. Speaker and of course Sonia Hooper is the, uh, the Assistant Deputy Minister within the department Mr. Speaker and these are two champions in early years Mr. Speaker so I did want to congratulate them sincerely and Mr. Speaker I was also really pleased to uh, to see the uh, the honorable member from Charlottetown West for royalty highlight the importance of the purple ribbon campaign Mr. Speaker I know that uh, last week a number of islanders participated in the um, the pinning bee whereby they were actually making the uh, the purple ribbons this is a really important uh, month and a per important lead up um, Mr. Speaker to December 6th and and certainly just that awareness around violence against women so appreciate the honorable member bringing that forward and, and thanks to the advisory council for all the work they do in this campaign Mr. Speaker, and if this is the last day, I wish us all a very productive day. It's been it's certainly been a wonderful session all around, and I want to thank everybody for, for their time and efforts in here. Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Land, Minister of Justice, Public Safety, and Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'd like to say hi to everyone in District 8, Stanhope Marshfield. I'll be uh, brief, Mr. Speaker, I was uh, privileged to speak at the uh, PI Potato Board AGM this morning and, uh, and uh, great hardworking uh, people there and it was great to address them. While we're speaking about mothers, Mr. Speaker, I am taking my, uh, my mother and uh, some of her WI friends. I'm joining them tonight at the Women's Institute Christmas Gala at the Delta. Uh, it's uh, their yearly gala event and uh, I think the Minister of Finance is joining me in the a couple other ministers will be joining me uh, at this event, and uh, it's a great event. And this year, the proceeds are going to the Surrey Hospital and the King County Memorial Hospital. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Did I miss anyone? <sighs> Honorable Minister, say hello to my wife this evening. <laughs> I won't get to see her, or she'll be coming in. I'll be going home. Honorable members, following up on a point of order raised by the member for Mermaid Stratford on November 5th, 2021, I do find the words false statement, even though it was used indirectly to a member, to be unparliamentary, un un and I asked all members of the House refrain from using this term in the future. 
I have found language from all sides of the House to be bordering on on parliamentary at times. And my approach has been an off hands approach. My mother always told me, and probably you too, never interrupt somebody when they're speaking. And honorable members, that's the approach I took. Honorable members, that's why I never made it in the referee world. So I didn't want to see a good play broke up by a blow of a whistle. So my approach has been allowed members to raise the point of order when they feel unparliamentary language has been used. However, you can expect more interjections from me on this if unparliamentary language continues. On the point of order raised, I will ask the Honourable Premier to retract comment false statements. Yes. Thank you. Members by statements. The Honourable Member from Summerside, South Drive. Statements by members. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To my great delight, the MLAs of this House passed a motion calling for the creation of a citizens' assembly, with MLAs from every party voting in favour. It is now in the hands of the Premier to develop and resource a citizens' assembly. The sooner, the better. I do hope we will see much fervor from, as much fervour from government to effectively implement and resource this important initiative as we have seen when it comes to the fervour for extra pavement. The reaction from the community upon the passing of this motion has been encouraging to be sure. I personally have received heartwarming messages from folks who have become disheartened that the systemic issues that our electoral system creates will never be addressed and continue to serve as a hindrance to setting long-term goals and imp implementing intergenerational plans that serve to create a society that better reflects the desire of the majority. Others who want to never feel the pressure to vote against something and instead always vote for their first choice, knowing that their vote will always result in a more, more representation for that choice in the legislature. Premier, you your, yourself are on the record as being in favour of a system of PR. I have spoken to you s since you made those public comments, both on the record here and in passing in the hallways, about electoral reform, and you always indicated that you would like to see action, but it should not be up to just you. Well, now you have the blessing of the legislature, nay, the request of the legislature to take action. There is a presentation online this Saturday at 3 p.m. on Citizens' Assembly for Electoral Reform, and I would encourage the relevant policymakers to attend so we can get moving in the right direction. Reach out. I'll share details. Islanders and far beyond are watching. They are waiting to hear and see your response. Please do not disappoint, as those in the past have. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This week is Transgender Awareness Week, a time to listen, celebrate the victories of trans people, and remember those who have lost their lives to anti-trans violence. It's, and it's an important time for each of us to reaffirm our commitment to the ongoing work of being allies. And that is ongoing work, because we're always learning, and we'll make mistakes, but that's part of it. Of all the things I could highlight, I think the most important is to really listen. Listen to what the trans people in your community are saying and commit to acting on what you learn. If you've only ever considered the world from a cisgendered perspective, it will no doubt be eye-opening how many things may affect trans people that didn't previously feel problematic to you because they've never affected you. But such as things like language people use in a given space or having access to gender-neutral bathrooms. But just because something isn't a problem for you doesn't mean it isn't a problem. And creating an environment that feels com comfortable for trans people to vocalize their issues is critical. I encourage everyone to take the time to learn and better recognize systemic barriers that trans and gender diverse people continue to face, particularly in this house when we talk about policies, programs, and initiatives. A good example of that is requiring a doctor to validate your gender identity. I thank the Justice Minister for agreeing with me that this is unnecessary, and I'll look forward to him updating the House that this has been changed. We also need to hear the concerns that are being raised in this community about the gender-affirming care clinic only operating two days a month. That makes it really hard to get into, and it doesn't even seem to be listed on government's website anywhere. There's a lot of work to be done, and we all need to be aware of it. 
Let Trans Awareness Week remind all of us that this week and every week, we need to listen to and learn from trans voices. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. Winslow. Winslow. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Although the weather doesn't quite reflect it yet, the holiday season is now upon us, and that's the motivation for my member's statement today. I rise today to announce the return of the City of, Charlottetown, uh, City of Charlottetown's annual Christmas Parade Presents, Santa Claus Comes to Town. This year will be another COVID-friendly parade tour that will feature the Charlottetown Police Services, Charlottetown Fire Department, Charlie Town, which is the city's official mascot, mayor and council, and of course, Santa Claus. The first day tour schedule and the route will begin this Monday in Sherwood Parkdale and it will end on Saturday, November 27th, starting at 5.30 each evening. For a detailed parade route uh, for the neighborhoods, you can visit the city's website. Letters to Santa Claus can be dropped off at the North Pole Post Office at the Confederation Court Mall. And while there, Mr. Speaker, you can also drop off a non-perishable food item at the Confederation Court Mall. This year, Mr. Speaker, with Santa Claus coming to town, the city of Charlottetown is also featuring a Get Festive contest. Individuals can enter the contest by wearing your festive favorites during your neighborhood parade tour and post a picture on social media. I do encourage residents of the city to get into a festive and holiday spirit by wearing a Santa hat, elf shoes, ugly sweater, holiday onesie, Rudolph nose, candy cane striped socks, and many more. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Questions by members, starting with response to questions taken as notice. The Honorable Member from Social Development and Housing. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I ask for your indulgence as I have more than one question taken as notice. Uh, so on November 16th, the member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park, asked questions pertaining to the maintenance of elevators at one of the government's seniors' homes. Mr. Speaker, uh, maintenance in government-owned housing units is necessary for safety, and staff work with contractors to minimize the amount of time maintenance work takes place while ensuring the work is completed with little to no unwarranted delays. To answer one of the member's specific questions, uh, there is contingency planning put into place for when certain maintenance takes place. And Mr. Speaker, I should mention that in the event of an emergency, elevators are not ever to be used, and that emergency personnel have processes to safely provide services. Uh, with respect to the specific building undergoing elevator maintenance, department staff have con contacted all tenants to review any issues or concerns. And as of Monday, November 15th, tenants did not identify concerns that have not already been managed. Uh, Mr. Speaker, on November 5th, uh, the leader of the third party asked questions pertaining to processes to review situations of harassment in seniors' housing facilities. Mr. Speaker, the department follows a three-step process, which includes one, verifying the complaint, two, discuss the complaint with the tenant who is the subject, and three, review any consequences of the specific incident. This could include verbal or written warnings in extreme cases, evictions, and mapping out next steps. Additionally, staff need to consider other circumstances, such as the tenant's health status, and determine if there are interventions that are needed by the tenant to help resolve the behaviors and maintain a successful housing placement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No one else? For our first question, I'll call on the leader, the official, the honorable leader of the official opposition. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. In 2018, a workplace violence survey of frontline healthcare workers on Prince Edward Island revealed that 90% of them have experienced violence in the workplace. The workplace violence referenced in the survey includes physical violence, such as hitting and biting and pushing and shoving and kicking, verbal abuse like swearing and threats and name calling and yelling and sexual harassment. Question to the Minister of Health. What has your government done to address these serious issues? Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I do appreciate the Leader of the Opposition bringing this forward. It is certainly it's an important issue. Uh, it's one that I have had uh, discussions with uh, the newly uh, appointed uh, permanent uh, CEO of Health PEI. I have been certainly uh, um, assured by the CEO that it is a high priority within health PEI and that actions will be taken and will continue to be taken, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Honourable the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks. So what I heard there is that the government has been talking about this, which is not what we need. We need action. A recent exit. 
Recent exit interviews of healthcare staff have revealed that workplace violence is still a common occurrence because this government is just talking about it rather than addressing it. Frontline staff survey did not feel that this government was doing enough to keep them safe from workplace violence. A question to the same minister. Will you immediately implement the recommendation to hire trained security to be on site at our hospitals to intervene when violent uh, incidents occur? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, I thank uh, the Leader of the Opposition for bringing this forward. Uh, it is certainly something that I will bring forward to CEO uh, of Health PEI as well as the executive leadership team, uh, Mr. Speaker. And uh, again, I do thank the Leader of the Opposition for bringing this forward and certainly uh, will advocate to the executive leadership team to put such measures in place. Thank you. The Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks, Speaker. You know, while I appreciate the gratitude of the Minister, I think the frontline healthcare workers would be a lot more thankful if you actually did something to address this. The PEI Violence Prevention Committee developed a flagging process for violent incidents in our healthcare facilities. Unfortunately, we've heard from unions and staff that leadership is not consistently using this process, which was created specifically to protect those frontline healthcare workers. A question to the same Minister. Will you commit to ensuring that leadership at Health PEI is consistently following the flagging of violent incidents procedures as developed by the PEI Violence and Prevention Committee? Honorable Minister of Health and uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the Honorable Leader of, uh, of the Official Opposition for this. Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, uh, the operational mandate, day-to-day uh, -day operations, is under the jurisdiction of Health PEI. But having said that, I do. I completely agree with what uh, the Leader of the Opposition has brought forward here and will completely advocate, strongly advocate, with the executive leadership team to make sure that this does take place, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Now the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So being threatened, assaulted, or harassed should not be part of any job anywhere, but particularly healthcare professionals who are working on the front lines. Question to the Minister of Justice. What will you do to ensure that justice and legal options are used to deter and address unlawful activities that happen to the island's healthcare professionals? Honorable Minister of Justice, Public Safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I've been listening to the, the correspondence back and forth here, Mr. Speaker, and this is uh, uh, an issue that is very serious, Mr. Speaker, and the Department of Justice will take all measures, Mr. Speaker, that uh, that, that we can to ensure the the health the, the safety of uh, our own health care providers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ms. Trafford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, earlier this sitting, I asked the Minister of Health and Wellness about changes to the long-term care subsidies brought in by this government, changes that deny some low-income seniors on fixed income financial support. The Minister thanked me for the feedback and committed to report back, but he has not. Question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. How many seniors have applied for long-term care subsidies and been denied because you are no longer exempting one-time payments from their income? Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In response to uh, the member's question, if I recall correctly, it was uh, insinuated uh, in originally that it was me as Minister of Health that was in, uh, in this chair at the time that those changes were made. When I did go back, Mr. Speaker, those changes actually were made back in 2019. Uh, there's different aspects to it with regard to regulations and the like. Mr. Speaker, I have directed staff to look into that. I am awaiting a briefing from staff on this matter and uh, certainly, uh, again, appreciate it being, being brought forward. Uh, sometimes things cannot and are not changed as rapidly as even I would like to see them uh, take place, Mr. Speaker. But it certainly is something that is on my radar. I will be looking forward to that briefing from staff and taking appropriate action. Thank you. Mermaid Stafford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the Health and Social Development Standing Committee received a letter of concern from a senior in Montague, and I am going to table this letter later on this morning, this afternoon. 
she and her husband took $20,000 out of her re retirement savings to repair the roof of their home. When her husband's health declined, requiring him to go into long-term care, this one-time $20,000 was added to its, his fixed income, making him ineligible for long-term care subsidy. This is impacting islanders now, not in the future, and not time for you to say, oh, we'll figure it out later. It's happening to them now, and they need you to act now. Yes. Question to the minister. Seniors need you to listen. They need their monthly recurring um, income accurately reflected when applying for government supports. Will you admit that removing the, the exemptions from the long-term care subsidy regulations was a mistake? Minister of Health and Wellness. Again, Mr. Speaker, and I do uh, thank uh, the member for bringing this forward. But for me to stand here and say that it was a mistake, I would anticipate, I would certainly hope that the decision made back in 2019, a substantial amount of time before I was actually in this chair, was made in good faith with good recommendations from staff. But with that, Mr. Speaker, I certainly I do appreciate uh, the, a situation of this individual, the couple that uh, the Honourable Member has brought forward, uh, and uh, for seniors right across this province. But we do. We have to be there for them. I know my counterpart in social development and housing, we heard earlier this afternoon with regard to a member statement, and it was referenced in Falls, that it's one of the things that uh, my counterpart through SDH in the Seniors Independence Program now have lifelines that can be incorporated into that as an expense. But Mr. Speaker, again, yes, when I get the briefing, the update from my department, I will take appropriate action. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, that was a long answer of saying nothing. Islanders need action and they need it now and this is a regulation this is something that can be changed tomorrow because it's in government regulations minister you need to take the briefing because this government denied the long-term care subsidy this couple couple had to pay three thousand dollars out of pocket that's more than a than a income sorry than a senior on fixed income earns in a month she's going into the hole every single month Unfortunately, her, her spouse has passed away, and now she's forced to pay this debt, and it's coming out of their, uh, out of the, out of the gentleman's, um, I'm sorry, coming out of his uh, life insurance policy. This is unacceptable, and I just can't believe the callous this government has become. This is something that is so important to this, to this senior's life. Minister, will you reinstate the income exemptions, and will you do it retroactively so that families are not shouldered with these limiting financial burdens that they're experiencing today? I'm a Master of Health and Wellness. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and again, I am going to answer the same way that I answered in the previous ones. Mr. Speaker, I do have confidence in my staff. I have confidence in the recommendations, the information that they will be bringing forward. Uh, for the member to state that I can shift a regulation tomorrow is... Uh, true. true. <laughs> inaccurate. It's actually true. No. Anyway, Mr. Speaker, as I said in my previous answers, when I do have the briefing from my department, I will take action. We have been there for seniors. We will continue to be there for seniors, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, in the last six months, we've heard serious allegations from island students and a lack of process in place to deal with those allegations. In fact, it's been awful for many teachers who are witnessing this and feel helpless. These incidents aren't tied to one school or one teacher. The common denominator is at the top. Question to the Minister of Education. You and your directors are responsible for the safety of students on PEI. What weaknesses have you identified since this has been brought to your attention, and what changes have you made? Of education, lifelong learning. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Honourable Member, for, for bringing forward a, an important question, Mr. Speaker, that has been at the forefront of many of the discussions I've had with both the Department and the PSB and CSLF, Mr. Speaker, as well as a variety of different stakeholders, including the Child and Youth Advocate Office. Mr. Speaker, this is a system-wide um, conversation, Mr. Speaker. 
We are looking at our policies, Mr. Speaker, our curriculum, Mr. Speaker, supports for students, um, our supports for teachers, and recognizing that, again, it's not one of these areas that's going to, to, to be a, a fix, um, Mr. Speaker. There's a lot of work that be, that's being done. I'm glad the member across recognized the important work of the teachers because, Mr. Speaker, our staff really have stepped up. They are dealing <laughs> With extenuating circumstances, especially with COVID, Mr. Speaker, these are challenging times. I've said it time and time again in here, Mr. Speaker, and certainly I do appreciate all the work that they do in our schools. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, these teachers are dealing with a challenging situation because you haven't put policies or processes in place for them to deal with it. Here's the problem, Mr. Speaker. Sex crimes happen all the time, and the justice system is ill-equipped to handle them. An expert from the University of Ottawa said, and I quote, sex crimes are basically decriminalized. If we leave this to the justice system to solve it, we'll be having this same conversation in a year, and in five years, and in 15 years. The education system is the place where we actually have a chance at addressing this before it lands in the criminal justice system. Question to the Minister of Education. What changes to school harassment policies are you making to ensure no students have to go to the justice system? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, honourable member, these are great questions, Mr. S Speaker. We have strong policies in place, but it's not to suggest, Mr. Speaker, that they don't need to be improved. And that's precisely why we are looking at policies such as the safe and caring learning environment policy. And certainly, I hope by the time we, we get up and speak about this next uh, spring, Mr. Speaker, that new policy will be in, in place. Because I know the staff are working extremely hard, Mr. Speaker. And and I, again, I, I've said this in the House uh, on, on various occasions, Mr. Mr. Speaker, but some of the work that we are doing, so we've hired a diversity consultant this summer, our gender and diversity guidelines. We're working with, all our, with, with partners, Mr. Speaker, peers, uh, pride, the child and youth advocate, Mr. Speaker. We've hired beyond the brim a consultant firm that is, uh, that is piloting some work in five of our schools across the island, Mr. Speaker. So there is a tremendous amount of work being done. This is an area of focus for our staff, Mr. Speaker. And again, I want to thank everyone involved in moving this important topic forward. Thank you very much. Mr. Side, Mr. Speaker, if the minister spoke to any of the students who are going through this, she wouldn't stand over there and pat herself on the back on how great things are going. And it's not just sex crimes that are the problem, Mr. Speaker. Last week, the Summerside police had to lay a charge after a physical assault of a student. When things escalate to the point that the police have to get involved or there is a school walkout, the minister is failing. We need to provide options for students that are being harassed that are effective. Question to the Minister of Justice. Whenever the education system fails to address this early on, it becomes your problem. Are you OK with children having to go to the justice system to fight to be safe in school? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, students need to feel safe uh, to speak to someone, Mr. Speaker. They need to feel that they can trust and uh, have have those people in place that they can confide in, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I don't, this this is a difficult conversation that we're having, and Mr. Speaker. We have to address it. We are the student well-being teams are a part of the school system, Mr. Speaker. The Justice Department is a part of that, Mr. Speaker. And those students need to feel safe and be able to talk to those uh, student well-being teams. Um, we also have the the youth justice workers as well, Mr. Speaker. And uh, if if uh, the students don't feel safe, they need to feel safe, Mr. Speaker. And if there's something we can do, we will. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm Valley Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In 2019, this government brought forward amendments to the Tourism Industry Act that required tourism establishments to be compliant with municipal bylaws as a condition of being licensed provincially. Question to the minister. How does the department verify that short-term rentals are compliant with their municipal bylaws? Minister of Tourism and Culture. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. So the department has worked uh, hard over the last couple of years on making sure uh, the short-term rentals are licensed. Uh, we've got staff in-house right now that uh, go through all, uh, all formats of, of listings to make sure they're licensed. They follow up uh, with a letter 
Uh, if they don't get a response, then they, uh, they go out with a second letter. Uh, if they still don't get a response, uh, then we take action with, with a fine, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, so they're um, monitoring daily as well as the new compliance system we do have. It will give us better data. Uh, I've, I've been told by the staff it's instant data, so it's going to help us be able to control uh, licensing on our end. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we know that this uh, is a particular issue in, in Charlottetown, as, as we have heard. According to their planning staff, if a short-term rental is not in a single detached home or owner-operated, it is not permitted. However, staff have expressed frustration that the province has nevertheless licensed units that don't meet these criteria. It's creating confusion because it suggests that these units are legal even though they are not. Minister, how many units has your department licensed that are not compliant with municipal bylaws and thus the Tourism Industry Act and what are you going to do to correct it? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So this has been a challenge uh, for years now. We've seen more uh, more housing go into short-term rentals. Um, so what we've been doing is is trying to work with uh, uh, with the municipality and, and determining which ones aren't licensed and which ones aren't uh, aren't uh, meeting the regulations. So uh, we've been back and forth. I know over the last couple of years it's been a big uh, issue here in Summerside or Charlottetown. Uh, it's nice to see that uh, there's some headway being made. We're going to continue doing what we can on our end to make sure that all these uh, uh, listings are in compliance. And if we need to make changes as we go, we'll certainly be open to it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, here's where it gets even more problematic. Short-term rental operators are now arguing that existing STRs should be grandfathered in under Charlottetown's new bylaws, even though in most cases the units aren't legal under existing bylaws. Their argument, the province has given its blessing by licensing these units. If these operators get their wish, hundreds of units will be permanently removed from the long-term housing supply. Premier, how can your government warn about intervening in the housing market when it clearly has no issue tipping the scales in favour of private interests that take long-term rentals off the market during a housing crisis? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I think we can all agree in this House that uh, we know the short-term rentals, there is some issues and there is some gaps. One thing I've heard over the last two years is numbers thrown around, uh, hundreds, two hundreds, thousands. We finally have a system that is going in. I will give kudos where kudos is due. The official opposition and uh, my critic at the time uh, brought this suggestion forward. We do now have a system that will help us uh, with, with those numbers to make them more accurate, to make sure that a lot of these uh, rentals are regulated and licensed. And like I say, if we need to make changes as we go, we certainly will. But at the same time, uh, we're going to continue doing what we're doing and, uh, and be open for discussion because if changes need to happen, we'll certainly be willing to look at them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On October 1st, 2019, there was a document released called Findings of a Community Needs Assessment on Emergency Shelter. This was an island-wide needs assessment prepared for the Department of Social Development and Housing. In this report, I will table that later. In this report, there are clear and concise recommendations that would make life significantly better for so many islanders. Question to the Minister of Social Development and, Development and Housing. What recommendations have you implemented from this report and what else can we expect to see? Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. So um, this report, I'm sure, is one that the Department of Social Development and Housing has read, taken very seriously, and we're making progress on those recommendations. I don't have it in front of me exactly which recommendations have already been uh, implemented, but I'm sure that the, the, less, the, list, the list is long, Mr. Speaker, because I know that the Department of Social Development and Housing takes all housing issues, in particular homelessness, very seriously. That's why we have the services in place that we do across this island, and I will bring that information back. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. So I'm noticing a trend with this minister where he doesn't think that he needs to know all of the reports. He doesn't need to speak to the people. It's There are people in place to do the job. It's your job to know about this. Some of the things... That, you, that was the response from the department, that there would be 24-7 shelter support. They provide case management, wraparound supports, transportation allowances, agreed to examine tiny house options, container house, housing, and fabricated housing to increase the housing stock 
quickly. One of the clear themes throughout this report is the crucial importance of bringing services to people in their own communities. And it's baffling to me that we would think any otherwise and try to get people from all communities into Charlottetown. Question to the Minister of Social Development and Housing. Will you commit to pro providing emergency shelter services to people in their own communities? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. That's a comprehensive list, and I believe we do all those things, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, we already do bring services to people in their own communities. Thank you. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. I'm not even sure how to respond to that, Minister. None of those things on the list I just said are being done. There was another... There was another report commissioned, which I will also table, by the Rotary Club of Montague. It is entitled Eastern PEI Housing Analysis. This final report was released in August 2019. In these reports, it lays out pretty clearly the state of both housing in general and homelessness in Eastern PEI. It is honestly surprising to hear some members who are still shocked by this. It's not a new problem by any stretch. Question to the Minister of Social Development and Housing. Your needs assessment is complete. Will you commit here today to providing emergency shelter services to islanders who live in eastern PEI? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I was talking to my department about that report uh, just yesterday, Mr. Speaker. And uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, I think for the member to stand up and say the needs assessment is complete is very naive, Mr. Speaker. For her to, to say that, they, that uh, the department does not uh, have the services that she listed and has not taken action is also very naive. And I would like to find out uh, and have her ask some good questions about what services we're not providing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, earlier this month we heard that the export of PEIC potatoes to markets in the United States has been halted. While potato wart does not pose any health risk to individuals, it can decrease yield and, as we've seen in the past, can have a large impact, income impact on one of the biggest industries. Any market shutdowns are a great concern to potato producers and government must provide clarity as soon as possible. Question to the Minister of Agriculture. What discussions have you had with your federal counterparts about getting the U.S. market reopened for seed potatoes? John Bill, Master of Agriculture, John Bill Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I would uh, acknowledge that there have been uh, two incidents of uh, potato wart discovered in uh, processing fields this uh, fall in Prince Edward Island. Uh, but uh, as of right now, Mr. Speaker, I'm not aware of any uh, shutdowns, Mr. Speaker, and I would caution the member opposite to. Uh, maybe choose a different venue to talk about uh, this particular issue, which has sensitivities around the world, Mr. Speaker, and could have potentially devastating impacts to a billion and a half dollar industry in Prince Edward Island. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Premier, for that answer. And, and that is our concern, is, is that it's a billion-dollar industry. And just a question, what supports will the government be offering to seed producers that have been impacted by this, if there is a border closure then? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, as we have demonstrated in the 30 months that we've been here, in particular the last 20, uh, during, uh, 20 months during COVID or 21 months during COVID, Mr. Speaker, if an industry such as agriculture requires our support, we will be there wholeheartedly, Mr. Speaker, and do everything we possibly can uh, in that time. But I would again caution the member, to suggest, Mr. Speaker, that uh, uh, th these are early days and uh, we shouldn't jump to any conclusions as to what might be the long-term impacts of this. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I've been long, I've been long time, I've been, <laughs> I've been passionate about wellness for a very long time, and uh, activity and movement is very important. Uh, when speaking about health care, we often look past wellness instead of focusing on treating the issue only after it arises. Proactive health care is an important piece of the healthy living continuum, and I hope to see greater efforts going forward to address uh, issues upstream before they enter the health care system. Question to the Minister of Health. How is your department currently tracking wellness initiatives and outcomes to determine if they are achieving the outlined goals? Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, yes, uh, I certainly realize the discussions that I've had with the Honorable Member, uh, the passion that he does have for this, and uh, the meeting that we had last week on a completely different issue but where we did touch on it and uh, certainly uh, put out uh, to uh, the Honourable Member 
more than happy to work with him on any initiatives along that line as well. Uh, but back to it, there are certainly a number of programs through the Department of, uh, of Health and Wellness, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, amateur sport programs. Uh, you know, we have a number of partners right across the province, whether it's with regard to sport PEI, recreation PEI, and uh, is there a monitoring? Certainly there is, Mr. Speaker. But as minister, I do have confidence as well in our partners that they deliver the programming that needs to be delivered. Thank you. Charlottetown West Royalty. And I, I guess we talked about this. And 23 months ago, uh, members of, of your, your department were in the, in the standing committee talking about wellness. Um, and having a new wellness strategy, and that was 23 months ago. And right now we've, we've faced, uh, we're coming out of the pandemic, our collective wellness is down. Um, we should be looking at different options. Um, well, I give credit to the government for putting a child tax credit, our child tax wellness credit in. We need to do this across the board for everybody. So question to the minister. Will you commit to expanding the wellness tax credit so that it's available to all islanders looking to improve their wellness? Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and it's certainly an interesting suggestion that the honorable member does make. Uh, it would be very difficult. That would certainly fall much uh, more under the jurisdiction of the Minister of Finance. But uh, again, uh, more than, uh, than happy to have that discussion and to, uh, to have a discussion with uh, the Honorable Minister of Finance as well going forward, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Charlottetown West Royalty, your second supplementary. Thank you. Uh, I hope she's listening. Uh, the last PEI wellness strategy. <laughs> the last PI wellness strategy was released in, in 2016. We know much has changed since then. We lived through a one-time pandemic, challenges in the healthcare system that are an all-time high, and increased cost of living is pricing some islanders out of wellness activities. A strong wellness strategy has the potential to reduce some of our physical and mental challenges before they reach the healthcare system, which is better for patients and the overall system. Question to the Minister of Health. When can Islanders expect your government to release an updated wellness strategy? Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as I'm sure the Honorable mem Member knows, uh, the strategic plan of the overall Department of Health and Wellness uh, uh, comes to an end, the present one, in this year. There is a new strategic plan that will be released uh, uh, in, uh, in the coming months, covering the subsequent three-year period. And I'm very confident, Mr. Speaker, that part and parcel of that strategic plan will deal exclusively with the aspect of, uh, of wellness, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I have a member from Tignish Pomeroy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Island businesses continue to navigate the impacts caused by the pandemic. And I commend them for ensuring that they kept both their employees and their customers safe. And as MLAs, we continue to hear from businesses that the labour shortage in our province is the biggest problem that they're facing. Many cannot find enough workers to keep their operations at full capacity. Um, there's even a problem in our own healthcare system uh, where uh, severe shortages have led to uh, service disruptions. My question is to the Minister of Economic Growth. What is your government's plan to address the significant workforce shortages our province is currently experiencing? Honorable Minister of Economic Growth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So uh, this is probably the number one concern I hear right now uh, in this heat is our labour shortage here in Prince Edward Island, Mr. Speaker. And one thing the department has done is uh, we've worked with industry uh, more hands-on than we've ever had before. Uh, we're providing uh, funding paths that will uh, help numerous sectors out, uh, trucking, construction, uh, health, uh, and so forth, Mr. Speaker. As well as immigration is still a, a big part of our, our workforce. Uh, we need to keep our uh, immigration numbers up, Mr. Speaker. We need to make sure that our skill sets are there. And uh, we're playing catch up right now. And I know there's a lot of people that uh, the blame the workforce uh, shortage on uh, CERB and EI. Uh, that's a small portion of it, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in reality, we've got uh, a lot of baby boomers retiring and uh, we have smaller families than we once did. So uh, it's going to take some time, but uh, we're prepared to work with industry to to approve it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are many reasons contributing to the workforce shortages beyond the pandemic, and one issue being discussed is that businesses aren't paying um, enough. While this may be true in some cases, in other cases, businesses simply are not in a position to drastically increase wages on their own following a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic. However, there could be a role for government to help. 
and provide assistance to businesses that would increase the wages, employee wages. Uh, so the question is for the Minister of Economic Growth. Would you consider developing a program to assist businesses with gradually increasing the employee wages? The Honorable Minister of Economic Growth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good question, Honourable Member. So that has been something that has been discussed uh, not only in my, my department, but uh, as well as around the Cabinet table as well. We want Islanders working, and uh, we want to make sure that businesses uh, survive. Uh, some positive news, Mr. Speaker, that there's actually more businesses now in Prince Edward Island uh, now than before the pandemic, uh, which, which is a good sign. So uh, we, we're certainly looking at that, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we, uh, we need some support with the federal government on that as well. Um, I would appreciate the honour member reach out to his fellow uh, uh, MPs uh, that he's worked with in the past to uh, uh, propose this to them as well, but uh, we would certainly be open for discussion on that, Mr. Speaker. And Tom Rogers, second supplementary. Thank you, Rush, Mr. Speaker. Um, the problem is not confined uh, to one sector or one industry. We have shortages right across our primary industries, fishing, farming, and tourism, and we also see it in construction and healthcare. Labor shortages are also not new to PEI, but as with many issues, COVID-19 has made the problem significantly worse. A robust strategy or plan is needed to deal with the various challenges in the workforce, one that encompasses labor, skills, wages, and other avenues for addressing the shortage. My question, will you commit to working with both the businesses and the workers on developing an updated workforce strategy to address the current labor shortages? John Bowmaster of Economic and Growth. Mr. Speaker, absolutely. So whatever we can do to improve uh, the labor situation here in PEI, we will, Mr. Speaker. Uh, one thing, like I say, uh, I give credit to uh, uh, the Skills PEI staff in my department. They're working hands-on with each and every industry right now, uh, which is great. So uh, it's really brought a, a good relationship between the department and industry. So we've seen industry come now with their own ideas that would help them uh, find uh, find workers uh, for those certain industries, Mr. Speaker, and we're providing the, the path forward financially as well as support. So we'll continue doing that and uh, we'll continually working hard to uh, make sure we uh, do whatever we can to help the labor force here in PEI. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Winslow. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in this House, we've all had the many conversations about the importance of retaining and recruiting our workforce in health care. Um, talking as recently with some constituents about the same thing. Um, the leadership of Health PEI have also spoke about this earlier this fall. My question today is to the Minister of Health. Uh, Minister of Health, is the Department or Health PEI looking at any new or even outside the box initiatives to help address the challenge of workforce retention? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the Honourable Member for uh, the question. Uh, he uh, uses uh, both the term uh, recruitment and retention. Uh, Mr. Speaker, they are so closely tied together that one of the things that we have heard from frontline workers, from uh, the unions, is just one of the challenges with regard to retention, and it goes back to uh, the previous uh, discussion debate here uh, between uh, Tignish Palmer Road and economic growth and tourism is just that HR shortage, the human resource shortage. And when we have a human resource shortage, as we do right across the board, but certainly in health, that has an impact right there on retention, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Shall I tell one slow? So again, that further uh, shows the need for that retention with the HR shortages, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, one thing that we've all heard about, it was referenced earlier today, is the success of the student well-being teams in our school systems and the support and mental health and the well-being of our students. My question to the Minister of Health, have we ever looked at if we could use sort of a workplace wellness model to help our health care workers feel better supported? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, excellent uh, suggestion uh, from the uh, Honourable Member. I think one of the things, too, though, the uh, Honourable Member mentions is with regard to student well-being teams. Uh, we look in our health care system. We have the uh, Student Futures Program, the Health Care Futures Program. Uh, we have uh, programs that we are able to bring nursing students in to work throughout the summer uh, periods, Mr. Speaker. And at this point in time, yes, with regard to recruitment, we are looking at uh, innovative uh, ideas, things that we can uh, bring forward uh, that uh, at the end of the day, not only are going to shore up the human resources, but also provide support 
to the individuals that are frontline healthcare workers that are working so tirelessly day in and day out. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlotte Town Winslow, your second supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And yes, uh, of course, the retention is an incredibly uh, important part of it. Um, and the big thing is, is with many cases in healthcare, it's the prevention sometimes is, be is the uh, the best outcome. Um, we have resources like the employment, or excuse me, the employee assistance programs to help our workers as they're in crisis. But if we did have a tool like the workplace wellness teams that they could support our workers before they reach that crisis point, I'm just asking maybe if the minister can look into this and through your department to help our workers in retention. Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker and Honorable Member. Absolutely would uh, be very happy to do that and would be happy to help uh, you join me in those conversations. Thank you. Summerside South Drive. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> we have heard from Summerside Council that their number one concern for us to bring forward in this House is to ensure all Summerside residents can be served by the Summerside Electric Utility. I asked about this last year in the House after the Minister of Communities said that at a meeting with Council that he was bringing it forward for discussion at the Cabinet table. The same Minister has told me since that the Electric Power Act takes precedence over the Municipal Government, Government Act. A question to the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. What communication has come from the City regarding this since and what was your response? The Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I'd have to go back and look and see what official correspondence has come, but I know every time I've had a conversation with the City of Summerside, this comes up. And I mean, we're very, obviously very enthusiastic about some of the things that they're doing themselves up there with their large solar project. And they're very progressive minded in how they're, they're moving forward. So they're always exciting partners to, to work with. So. Uh, as far as what the official correspondence back and forth is, I really have to go back and, and, and look at it. But, you know, as you know, there's a lot of complexities with how we're trying to move forward with, with energy. And I know that this is their number one issue. And, uh, you know, I also have a number of issues that need to be dealt with, I think, too, as far as electricity goes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Summerside South Drive. Hey, Mr. Speaker, the issue is not new. Uh, the ask has been repeated for years, as the minister has alluded to. The power is in the minister's hand to change the act or regulations or whatever might be in the way. The Municipal Government Act is clear that the municipality is free to offer service to all residents within its boundaries. The Electric Power Act is all that remains to stand in the way. A question to the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. The act you are responsible for is standing in the way of Summerside Electric offering that service to all of its Summerside's residents. What have you done in the years, over the years, that has been true to address it. What have you done in the years that has been to address it? Sorry. The Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy, okay. Climate Action. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Probably not enough to, do, to, to address that particular issue, and quite frankly, probably not enough to deal with the issues with the Power Act period on Prince Edward Island. I think I'd be lying if I told you I was anything but frustrated with my ability to move that file quicker than it's been moving. Uh, that said, I'm very committed to the, the view that I think we probably have a common view in, in energy to some degree, at, very, at least. And uh, um, I'm going to continue to push on, on moving it forward. And uh, I, when, when we went out for um, went out to the public to ask for recommendations for things that like to be, see changed, I know Summerside has responded. They've been very clear what their ask is. It's, it's decades old, the, the issue that they have. And uh, I think at the end of the day, we have to figure out how to make everybody happy. But I guess that's the best I can commit to now is to try to continue to move forward and, and see how many people I can make angry while I try to make others happy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> the Leader of the Official Opposition, final question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, earlier this year, the Minister for Social Development and Housing committed to bringing forward legislation in this sitting on supported decision making. It would have provided a system of supports that allows people with intellectual challenges to live with more independence, making decisions for themselves. Last week, I discovered that this legislation is no longer going to be introduced during this sitting, as promised by the minister. And this afternoon, my colleague, Charlotte Ann Belvedere, will be presenting an amendment to the Rental of Residential Properties Act to end rent evictions because this minister has failed to bring forward the Residential Tenancy Act, something we've been waiting for for two years. 
earlier in question period, the same minister suggested that my colleague from Charlottetown, Victoria Park, when she said that Last this chair. minister is not coming forward, the tiny homes and container homes and 24 wraparound services is misled, or naive, I think was the word you used. Naive. Question to the Premier. Are you satisfied with the performance of your Minister of Social Development? Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I am very satisfied with the performance of our Cabinet, Mr. Speaker, in what has been the most difficult time that's faced this province in 100 years, Mr. Speaker. I have said in this House repeatedly, have we hit them all out of the park? Absolutely not. Uh, is there work that remains, Mr. Speaker? Absolutely. Can we work all in here together, Mr. Speaker, to get results? Yes, we can, and that's what I would encourage, Mr. Speaker. I think we do really, really, really strong and important things when we work together and we leave the silliness to the background, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. End of question period. Statements by ministers. The Honourable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Mr. Speaker, our arts and culture industries are incredibly valuable to Prince Edward Island. They contribute greatly to our provincial economy and society, and they play an essential role in connecting islanders and showcasing our island to people around the world. One of the ways government continually supports island artists is through our arts grants program. Mr. Speaker, there's been a very positive ripple effect from the arts grants program. We're committed to keeping this momentum going. Today, Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to announce the recipients of the fall 2021 arts grants. They are Colton Curtis, Hans Wundt, Kirsty McCollum, Ryan McCarville, Doug Dumais, Damian Wirth, Jenna McMillan, Scott Parsons, Teresa Cujo, Renee Laprise, Ryan Drew, Ariel Sherritt, Sid Acharya, and Tyler Landry. Congratulations and thank you, Mr. Speaker. member from Tom Valley, Sherbrooke, and the opposition whip. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's a pleasure to rise and uh, congratulate all of the uh, winners of the uh, Arts Grants uh, Awards, uh, or uh, sorry, Arts Grants this year. Um, it's fantastic to hear that. Uh, we know that these grants are a critical part of our cultural ecosystem and really support our um, artists uh, uh, in a way that is absolutely necessary to ensure that uh, that cultural component uh, that is so important to us here in PEI continues to grow and thrive. So it's a wonderful announcement, and again, congratulations to all those who were successful this year. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, West Royalty, uh, third party, House Leader. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's a, a great announcement. These are incredibly important uh, awards, and uh, I just, you're thinking about the collective talent in, in that list is, is unbelievable. And, and uh, I just noticed, I just heard Scott Parsons in there, so it's, uh, he's, uh, he's well-deserved for that award. So cultural building in PEI is, is alive and well, and I think it's, it's going places, and these awards help very much. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Presenting and receiving petitions. <coughs> Tabling of documents. The Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action. Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Rule uh, 1109 of the Rules of the Legislative Assembly of Prince of Island, I am pleased to respond on behalf of the Government of Prince of Island to the recommendations made by the Special Committee of Climate Change, and I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the said document be received and do now lie on the table. Shaw Carey. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you. Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Rule 1109 of the Rules of Legislative Assembly of Prince Edward Island, I'm pleased to respond on behalf of the Government of Prince Edward Island to the recommendations made by the Standing Committee of Public Accounts, and I move second by the Minister of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action that the said be, document be received and do lie on the table. Shall carry. carry. The Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Rule 110, bracket 9 of the Rules of the Legislative Assembly of Prince Edward Island, I am pleased to respond on behalf of the Government of Prince Edward Island to the recommendations made by the Standing Committee on Health and Social Development. I move, seconded by the Minister of uh, Agriculture, Lands and Justice, that the said document be received and do lie on the table. So, Carrie. Carrie. The Honorable Minister for Agriculture, Land, Justice, Public Safety, and Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, pursuant to Rule 110, 
nine of the rules of the Legislature Assembly of Prince Edward Island, I am pleased to respond on behalf of the government of Prince Edward Island to the recommendations made by the Standing Committee on Health and Social Development. And I move, second by the Minister of Finance, that the said document be received and do lie on the table. Shaw Carey. Carey. The Honourable Member from Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke, and the Opposition Whip. Uh, Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table internal correspondence uh, at the City of Charlottetown expressing concern over the province renewing the tourism licenses of municipally non-compliant tourist accommodations. And I move, seconded by the member for Charlottetown Belvedere, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Carry. Yeah. Oh, Tyne Valley Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table a letter from the legal counsel of short-term rental operators to the City of Charlottetown, <laughs> arguing that these short-term rentals are lawful uh, and should be grandfathered under any new provincial regulatory re regime because the province is not enforcing its requirements for these tourism establishments to comply with municipal bylaws. And I move, seconded by the member for Charlottetown Belvedere, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Carry. carry. The Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Pursuant to Rule 1109 of the Rules of the Legislative Assembly of Prince Edward Island, I'm pleased to respond on behalf of the Government of Prince Edward Island to the recommendations made by the Standing Committee on Natural Resources and Environmental Sustainability, and I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the said document be received and do lie on the table. Shall it carry? The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford and the Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table a letter from an island um, senior who outlines the hardship that her family experienced because of the regulations that were removed from the Long-Term Care Subsidy Act. And I move, seconded by Charlottetown Victoria Park, that this said document do now be received and do lie on the table. Shall sure, carry. Carried. Carried. Delegable Mass for Agriculture, Land, Justice, Public Safety, and the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table responses, questions taken as notice on the ILS program that outline our government's commitment to the ILS program, increasing budget since we formed in 2018-2019. Uh, and I move, second by the Honourable Minister of Finance and Deputy Premier, that this said document be now received and do lie on the table. Honourable Member, Minister, can you get another seconder? Uh, Minister of... Climate, environment, transportation, and innovation. <laughs> Infrastructure. <laughs> that was very innovative. It was innovative. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. The Honourable Member are. from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. By leave of the House, I beg leave to table findings of a community needs assessment on emergency shelters. And I move, seconded by Mermaid Stratford, that the said document be received be now received and do lie on the table. And this document talks a lot about its very clear, concise recommendations on what we can do to help resolve the housing crisis and people who are housing insecure on all levels of the, of the spectrum. Um, and uh, it talks about offering supports to the community, to community organizations and partners to help, uh, working with them um, and, work, and offering supports in people's communities. It talks about offering 24-7 care and emergency shelter, providing case management for each individual with wraparound supports and allowances for transportation. Um, government also agreed in, this, in their response to examine tiny house options, container housing and fabricated housing to increase the housing stock quickly. I did that backwards, didn't I? Thank you. Shall we carry? Carry. Carry. Mr. Speaker, by leave of the... Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. By leave of the House, I beg leave to table Eastern PEI housing analysis, a final report. Um, uh, so this this report looks specifically was was commissioned by the Rotary Club of Montague when they were recognizing that people were having barriers to to housing and there were a lot of housing issues. Um, they took it upon themselves to to get this drafted, and it talks um, a lot about the different ways people are housed or not housed in in Eastern PEI, um, and the numbers of homelessness are quite um, quite high. So I move seconded by. Uh, Mermaid Stratford, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall we carry? Carry. Did I miss anyone? Oh, God. Honorable, Honorable Minister of Agriculture and Land, I apologize. I didn't hear the word deputy in your finger, so I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> Re
Reports by committees. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown <laughs> West Royalty and the Third Party House Leader. Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Standing Committee on Health and Social Development, I beg leave to introduce the report of the said committee regarding the committee activities. And I move seconded by Tignish Palmer Road that the same, the same be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Mr. Speaker, I would like to seek unanimous consent of the House to proceed with the motion of adoption of the, uh, with this report today. Honourable Members, does he have una unanimous consent? Yes. yes. Honourable Member, you have unanimous consent. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, I move sec seconded by the Honourable Member for Tignish Palmer Road that the report of the committee be adopted. Your committee is reporting on activities since the committee's last reported on April 27, 2021. Since then, your committee met 18 times to consider a number of important topics, including recruitment and retention of health care workers, organ and tissue donation, indigenous reconciliation, and anti-racism. Your committee also undertook a study of Bill Number 18, Gunshot and Stab Wounds Report Act. Recommendations based on the review have been put forward in a separate report. As a result of its deliberation, your committee is pleased to make the following recommendations to the member of members of the Legislative Assembly. Uh, five recommendations on the topic of recruitment and retention of health care professionals. Number one, your committee recommends that government initiate an independent review of the internal hiring process across the Department of Health and Wellness, Health PEI, and the Public Service Commission in order to identify areas and opportunities to strengthen the recruitment process. Your committee recommends that government ensure a communication policy is developed which clearly defines the criteria for when communication must occur between health PEI and patients of the health care services. Your committee recommends that government ensure workplace safety and satisfaction is prioritized in all efforts to improve retention of health care professionals. Your committee recommends that government ensure that all relevant stakeholders are consulted in the early stages of planning and implementation, implementation of health care policies and programs. Your committee recommends that government review the return in service commitment for new graduate nurses through the Nursing Recruitment Initiative Program and implement changes to provide flexibility. On the topic of organ donation, your committee recommends that government consider all options to increase organ and tissue donations. On the topic of Indigenous reconciliation, your committee recommends that government work with the Mi'kmaq communities to come to an agreement upon statement of facts. Your committee recommends that government ensure the implementation of treaty rights education for students, civil servants, and the general public. Your committee recommends that government ensure Mi'kmaq language is further incorporated, maintained, and celebrated across Prince Edward Island. Your committee recommends that government adopt the principles of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Your committee recommends that government consider investing in housing initiatives with the First Nation communities of Prince Edward Island. Your committee recommends that government consider investing in transitional housing initiatives in partnership with the Native Council of Prince Edward Island. Your committee recommends that government consult with the Native Council of Prince Edward Island when issues arise that directly impact the community that they represent. On the topic of anti-racism, your committee recommends that government undertake race-based data collection across various fields, including health care, housing, employment, education, to allow government to identify and remove systemic barriers within its policies and programs. Your committee recommends that government encourage recruitment of BIPOC mental health professionals as well as prioritize training for non-BIPOC mental health professionals in race-based trauma. Your committee recommends that government consider options to ensure continuity of government support, supported health care for international students. Your committee recommends that government consider investing further in groups who provide supports and advocacy for bi the BIPOC community such as Black Cultural Society of Prince Edward Island. Your committee recommends that government consider creating an anti-racism secretariat within executive council to ensure provincial government 
is equipped to identify and remove systemic racial barriers and gaps in policy, services, and programs. On the topic of fire service delivery, your committee recommends that government advocate for increased staffing levels for career firefighters in the city of Charlottetown. And I'd just like to add uh, uh, thank you to all our guests of the committee. It was a very active committee. Um, we, we saw a lot of different issues talked about, and I want to thank each and every member of that committee for, for doing such a good job with this committee, this very, very important committee report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Is there any other one, anybody else that'd like to speak to the report? No? Shall I carry? Carry, carry? The Honorable Member from Tignish Pomeroy, Deputy Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as Deputy Speaker, on behalf of the Standing Committee on Legislative Assembly Management and yourself as Chair, I beg leave to introduce the unanimous report of the Committee regarding Bill 121, an act to amend the Election Expenses Act. And I move, seconded by the Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford, that the same be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? carry. The Honourable Member from Tignish, Pomeroy, Deputy Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I seek unanimous consent to proceed with the motion for adoption of the report. Honourable members, does he have unanimous consent? Yes. yes. Yeah. Honourable member from Tignish Palmer Road. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Recommendation. While this bill does, does have implications on the operations of the Legislative Assembly, the committee recognizes that should the House decide to pass this bill, the committee will determine how to exercise its powers and duties as outlined in the rules of the Legislative Assembly and the Legislative Assembly Act. I move, seconded by the Honourable Member, from Mermaid Stratford that the report of the committee be adopted. Is there any other members that would like to speak to this report? No? Should I carry? carry. <coughs> the Honourable Member from Summerside, Wilmot. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by Tyne Valley Sherbrooke that the 33rd order of the day be now read. Shall I carry? Carry. Order 33, Non Disclosure Agreements Act, Bill Number 118, ordered for third reading. The Honorable Member from Summerside, Wilmot. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by Tyne Valley Sherbrooke, that the said bill be now read a third time. Shall carry. Carry, carry. Bill number 118, Non Disclosure Agreements Act, read a third time. The Honorable Member from Summerside, Wilmot. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by Tyne Valley Sherbrooke, that the said bill do now pass. Honorable Members, this is a bill introduced by leave of the House, read a first time, read a second time, committed to the committee of the whole House, reported and agreed without amendment, read a third time, and is now moved that the bill do not pass. All those in favor, say yay. Yay. Contrary, nay. I will never, bill's passed. The Honourable Member from Tyne Valley, Shorebrook, and the Opposition Whip. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by Summerside Wilmot, that the 34th order of the day be now read. Shall it carry? Carry. Order 34, an act to amend the Employment Standards Act, Bill Number 119, ordered for third reading. The Honourable Member from Tyne Valley, Shorebrook, Opposition Whip. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by Summerside Wilmot, that the said bill be now read a third time. Shall it carry? Carry. Bill number 119, an act to amend the Employment Standards Act, read a third time. The Honorable Member from Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke, and the Opposition Whip. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by Summerside Wilmot, that the said bill do now pass. <laughs> Honorable Members, this is a bill introduced by leave of the House, read a first time, read a second time, Committed to the committee of the whole House, reported, agreed to, with amendment, read a third time, and is now moved 
that the bill do not pass. All those in favor, say yay. Yay. Contrary, nay. Honorable member, bill's passed. The honorable member from Mermaid Stratford and the opposition house leader. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by Charlottetown Belvedere that the 35th order of the day be now read. Charlotte Carey. 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 Order 35, an act to amend the Rental of Residential Property Act, Bill Number 122, ordered for second reading. Charlotte Carey. Oh, honorable member from Mermaid Stratford, the opposition house leader. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by Charlottetown Belvedere that the said bill be or be now read a second time. Sure, Carrie. 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 Bill number 122, an act to amend the re Rental of Residential Property Act, read a second time. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford, the Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by Charlottetown Belvedere that this House do now resolve itself into a Committee of the Whole House to take in con into consideration the said bill. Sure, Carrie. 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 The Honourable Member from Tignish Pomero to Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please. The House is now in a committee. The whole House has taken into consideration a bill to be intitled an act to amend the Rental of Residential Property Act. A request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? State your name and position for Hansard. Uh, my name's Connor Kelly. I'm the tenant network coordinator with the Cooper Institute and PEI Fight for Forever Housing. Thank you very much and welcome. Um, Minister, or Minister, sorry, promoter. Okay. <laughs> uh, would you like to begin by giving a general uh, statement on the bill's intent? Sure, that would be really great. Thank you, Chair. Um, and it's Nice to see you here, thank you. Um, so this is a, uh, a simple but impactful amendment to an existing piece of legislation to the um, Rental and Residential Property Act. It is um, a amendment to address a specific clause which currently allows for um, eviction for renovation. Um, these are commonly known as rental evictions. And a renovation ren ren is when a landlord evicts a tenant by claiming that they're going to complete major renovations to a rental unit. Um, renovation is one of uh, many, many reasons that a tenant can be evicted. We know about, you know, tenants can be obviously be evicted because they haven't paid their rent or because they're disruptive. There's many reasons. This is only one. Um, but it's one that is being used um, more and more without... Um, uh, necessarily do recourse and with significant impact to 
to tenants who are, who are being impacted. Um, most renovations or repairs can be carried out without ending a tenancy um, and with only minor disruption to tenants. And subsection 15.1 of the Rental Residential Property Act, which this um, amendment addresses, says that a landlord can only evict a tenant to conduct renovations when acting in good faith, that those renovations or repairs really require a tenant to leave. Um, we can often think about renovations might be um, replacing the kitchen countertops or redoing floors or painting or that, that kind of work. That doesn't require the tenant to leave the premises. Um, the kind of thing that might require somebody to leave is if it is actually unsafe for them to be there. That could be asbestos remediation or that the power or the water is going to be shut off. And so the requirement of the landlord to be acting in good faith is a primary part of this, this legislation that currently exists that said it's assumed that the landlord is going to do their best to ensure that the tenant is, is protected and doesn't have to leave. What happens is that there are some landlords who are not acting in good faith and are using the opportunity to use the reason of renovation to evict tenants um, with uh, not necessarily the, the work happening that they have said is going to. Tenant after tenant is receiving eviction notices for renovations that aren't enough to warrant their eviction and often the apartment then is relisted at a higher rental with only cosmetic repairs. Rent evictions this year alone number in the hundreds, and my, my uh, stranger here will be able to tell us what that looks like as the person who actually deals with people who are work going through that process. As the promised and long overdue Residential Tenancy Act is still not tabled, this amendment will provide for an immediate moratorium on rent evictions only for a period of two years or until the new legislation is tabled. It will immediately suspend the ability of a landlord to evict a tenant for renovation. It will suspend any notices of eviction that were served but have not yet been completed, so ones that are currently in progress, and will take effect immediately if proclaimed. It is important to note that um, despite the significant increase in tenant supports provided by Community Legal Information and the PEI Fight for Affordable Housing, many tenants don't know that they can appeal on eviction. We don't have the numbers of how many tenants are being evicted because in eviction notices when they're served, taped to somebody's door, that's usually how you find out, are not required to be filed with IRAC. It's only when somebody appeals that we have a record of it. So we know that it's hundreds, but we don't know exactly how many. And those tenants, if they do want to appeal, have to go through a complex, challenging and really scary process with no legal aid. Connor here is the person who has been helping more islanders than you can imagine through this process in his role as tenant navigator. And I was wondering if you could just speak very a bit, a bit about what that actually looks like for a tenant. I think you just came uh, from a hearing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so we weren't sure if he was going to get here on time because he was doing a hearing for a tenant prior to coming here today. But if you could speak just about what that looks like for a tenant, we think it'd be really helpful. Uh, so just see the whole process of going yeah. through the hearing. Um, yeah, so usually the process I go through is, uh, like, I'll hear from a tenant that they're being evicted or getting a rent increase or something like that. For the purpose of this, I go through a rent eviction process. Um, I'll hear somebody's getting rent evicted, so I'll meet with them, um, talk to them about what they're going through, uh, what happened up until the rent eviction, because sometimes it's come up that like, there's been an interaction with the landlord that the landlord's now punishing the tenant with a rent eviction. Um, I walk them through the process, which is that they have to file a certain form within a certain amount of days from when they got the notice. Uh, and after that, they have a certain amount of days to get evidence in. Um, the kind of evidence they have to usually get requires often like getting the testimony or like affidavits or written statements from tradespeople to justify whether or not the renovations need to happen um, and pictures of their unit. Uh, then they have to prepare for a hearing, they have to put together a position, um, they have to submit all the evidence by the deadline, uh, and they have to arrange for like when and where they're going to be calling in from. Usually it's their apartment. Um, the process takes about a month, and the entire time the like clock on the eviction is ticking. So the moment you served, you have, I think it's like two or three months um, to leave. So the entire time somebody's both having to put together a legal argument and figure out if they're going to have a place to live and if they can find a place to live. Uh, and most of the time, um, people are fairly out of sorts throughout the whole process. Um, I've talked to tenants who uh, basically are considering like, suicide if they don't win because um, they'll end up being homeless because they have no options to find housing. Um, 
there's other times with people who have a history of post-traumatic stress disorder that will be flaring up. Um, I've talked to, I've worked with tenants who had to stop fighting their evictions because they had cancer and it was accelerating from the stress uh, and their nurse was really confused, a different tenant, um, was very confused because the tenant's blood pressure had shot up and like they were on the brink of needing medication. Um, and this is from like a one month period of just trying to fight an eviction for renovations. Um, and almost entirely, there are always renovations that if the landlord's acting in good enough faith, like they can accommodate the tenant if they really want to. It's just that they don't. Um, so that's generally what the process is like. Uh, the last part is that they have to usually present their position to the landlord in a hearing and like deal with talking to the landlord back and forth about whether or not they're justified in getting kicked out of their home, um, which usually is not is a pretty intense experience for tenants. Um, and overall, it's a really unpleasant experience. Uh, they have to gamble between do they fight the eviction or do they find a place to live. Um, so that's overall what the process is like. Great, thank you. Um, all of our members, is it the wish of the committee that the bill be now read section by section, clause by clause, or open it up just for general questions? Okay, it's open for discussion. Uh, Minister of Social Development and Housing. Well, well thank you, Chair. And uh, I wanted to thank the, uh, the sponsor of the bill for the, uh, for the briefing this morning on this bill. We were able to go through it, have a have a short discussion, and it is, as she as she indicates, a, a pretty um, short bill and um, with with profound uh, impl implica uh, implications. I mean, um, so so landlords, of course, provide a very valuable um, service in the province, but it's it's really important that, uh, and and I think most most do realize like that these are people's homes that they're providing, and it's important that um, they. Um, play a role in, in the continuity of people's homes. Um, and, and so, Chair, um, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, rent evictions, as they call it, so evictions uh, for, for renovations, um, I mean, the assumption here is that, you know, many, many landlords are, are acting on bad faith. I prefer to take the, the uh, view that most landlords are acting in good faith, but there, there are definitely problems with the process as well, the complaints-based process, as the, uh, the stranger talked about. So this is why um, I, I was uh, really happy when we brought the policy expertise for the Rental of Residential Properties Act, which is the current act being amended, but also for the new rewrite of that act, which is the Residential Tenancy Act, in-house because it, it's complicated, it involves tenants and landlords and a delicate balance between the two. Um, I really feel like uh, the department has made a very good progress. I, I know they met with uh, the stranger on the floor at least once, if not a couple of times. And once we have the, uh, the consultation draft ready, the, 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 well, I'm sure there'll be another meeting. And we want to make sure we get this right. It's been, it's been 30 years since this act was updated, and it means people's homes are on the line. We have to get this right. So. Um, but so so during the pandemic, uh, Chair, we we did put a moratorium uh, on evictions. We did that through a different route than this. Um, but we looked at uh, what the members trying to do here. Um, and one one of the concerns um, that that frankly I had was, you know, in some cases, um, when landlords are acting in, in good faith, you know, there are circumstances where. You know they really need to do renovations for safety and security uh, of the tenants. You know, so if you have a, a unit where there there's significant mold um, to the extent where a tenant may have to move out to do renovations to fix those health issues, or you know might you might have a, a pipe burst that causes flooding and there's six inches of water again. This is not a situation where necessarily the tenant can stay in the unit um, while the renovations are done. I think it's really important that we. Uh, we still allow, you know, uh, those renovations to happen. Uh, so, Chair, I just wanted to introduce an amendment uh, to this bill, and uh, the copies, I believe, are with the with the clerk. Um, <clears throat> and um, so, I'd like to move that uh, section one of Bill Number One Twenty Two is amended by the addition of the following, after the proposed uh, new subsection five five. And so it's exception, uh, this is subsection six. Subsections four and five do not apply 
where the renovations are necessary to protect or preserve the property or to protect the health and safety of persons. Okay, thank you very and, much. Yeah. Um, just one more second. Um, honorable member, so a copy will uh, be passed to each of you. Um, after you receive it, I'll give you a moment to review it mm -hmm. and I'll open the floor again for uh, more discussion on it. Um, however, I'm going to turn okay. the floor over to the promoter. Thank you, Chair. I haven't seen this amendment yet. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't aware of the details until now. So uh, I, I would like to ask for a recess so we can have a moment to look at it in review with my stranger and mm -hmm. um, myself. So take a five minute recess. I'd much appreciate it. Um, can you give her a copy of it? Yeah. Yeah, I'll give you a, um, time to, okay. to review it. Yeah. Can I get another copy? Oh, it's okay. We'll share it. We're, we're not on recess, so um, please uh, remember decorum. Cameras are on, microphones are on. And I'm, again, I'm just giving you each a moment just to review it, um, to compile questions if you have, and I'll open the floor to discussion very shortly. That's what the floor of the house is for. It's a, it's a discussion okay. on this. I have not so. seen this amendment. Mm -hmm. I have not had an opportunity yeah. to look at this yeah. and see how it would work, yeah. whether it actually is yeah. legislatively yeah. appropriate. I, I, I'm assuming that it's okay yeah. because it's obviously gone through Ledge Council, yeah. but Chair, uh, I, I have no idea whether this is in the intent and spirit of the of the amendment that I've mm -hmm. brought forward. Mm -hmm. And I think that I would be it would be fair, given that this has literally just arrived in front mm -hmm. of me for the first time, that I can ask for a recess so I can discuss the impact of this in a place without the, the challenge of my mic being open for that time period, which would normally happen when we do briefings and things outside the space of this floor. And I, remember, I totally understand that, but the mm -hmm. floor of this house is for debate and discussion. So mm -hmm. amendments can be made on the floor of the house okay. and we can discuss it here. All right, then, then I am going to be asking some questions. Y you, <laughs> I, I would need to yeah, be able to ask yeah. questions, no, then, I Chair, as, even though I am the pro promoter. Yeah. I have, if this is an amendment coming forward, I have to be able to ask. You can ask questions and mm -hmm. if uh, there's an intervention um, mm -hmm. requested, I will okay. acknowledge. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so um, we have two primary clauses in the amendment that I have brought forward. The first one is a clause which says that um, clause 15.1c of the existing Rental Residential Property Act, which is the one that allows landlords to use the rent eviction option, um, would be suspended immediately as soon as this bill is, is portrayed. And, and I've, I've made clear what the reasons for that are. Um, I think um, Connor could speak to that the overall, there's a couple of things that are important around that. I'm going to have to step through this chair, I'm sorry. But um, if we look at the original clause in the original Rental Residential Property Act, the very first part of 15.1 states that the lesser is acting in good faith. So the lesser, that's the landlord. So the landlord is acting in good faith. This whole clause presumes that the landlord is acting in good faith. So we are never making a statement that all assumptions are that the landlords are in bad faith. The legislation actually assumes that the landlord is acting in good faith and then sets conditions of how they should conduct themselves. Okay, now clearly that's been a problem because what we have is the legislation, that assumption isn't able to be followed up with the law as it is now. The assumption that the landlord is acting in good faith isn't backed up by them being required, for instance, to demonstrate that, to demonstrate that the renovations that they require, for example, are um, uh, required the, the tenant to move out. That does it. It's the, la it's the tenant that has to demonstrate it, not the landlord. So we know that in the new Residential Tenancy Act, those are some of the concerns that we brought up. And, you know, we've heard from the minister that 
um, yeah, this is an ongoing piece of work. We consulted as the official opposition for the first time on the draft of the Residential Tenancy Act in December 2019, two years ago. We have not consulted on it again since, and neither has the public. So going on the, the discussions that we had on that the first time around, this was one of the areas which was then identified, Mr. Sp uh, Chair, as a real area of concern because the assumption in legislation that the landlord is acting in good faith was being proved over and over to not be true. And it's only a small number of landlords that are choosing to abuse that, but when there's a space that they can, they can do so, unfortunately, some are. So it's really important that we establish that this is not an assumption that landlords are acting in bad faith, it's actually that the legislation assumes the opposite, and it's the responsibility of us to demonstrate that. So this first clause states that we want to suspend the uh, clause that allows the uh, eviction for renovation of premises, because that good faith is not being adhered to, Chair. Um, the second clause then states that um, any ongoing current activities where the eviction has not happened but a, but a notice has been served would also be suspended for this time period because this process, as you heard from uh, Mr. Kelly, is um, extremely long, onerous and complicated, so there are a number of different processes in, actually in action at the moment as well. My understanding then, looking in that context, looking at this amendment, that it adds an additional clause that states that subsections four and five would not apply. So the amendments that I am bringing in this legislation would not apply where the renovations are necessary to protect or preserve the property or to protect the health and safety of persons. That is actually already the intent of the clause that we are, as far as I can see from this initial reading, Chair, that is the intent of that this clause that we are seeking to suspend because that is exactly the problem. When somebody files, when a landlord files an eviction notice for renovation, the assumption is, if they're acting in good faith, it's because they have to, because somebody's life or danger uh, or safety is going to be in danger if they remained in the premises. But that's not what, that's not the case. So if we can't prove that now, how are we going to prove it with this amendment added in? Perhaps, Connor, if you could just speak to what the renovation reasons are and what they actually look like in, the, in your experience of the files that you're working with. How many files do you have currently? Um. Right now, if I make them individual apartments, it's over 30, no, over 40. It's individual apartments, but in groups, it's about three or four big ones and then three or four small ones. Mm -hmm. So we're dealing, like, like at the moment, with one group of, of 11 tenants out of 27, mm -hmm. 27 units that are being evicted, for example. So that's one whole group, but it's 11 separate files that are going together as a group. That would be one example, which is all around eviction. Um, and they were filed with, a, with a, the notice that said they were being evicted for renovations, and those renovations wouldn't meet the criteria. No, I think it was something to the effect of replacing railings, redoing kitchen cabinets, and either bathroom or kitchen floor, like very superficial, and mm -hmm. that comes up fairly often. I, there was a renovation in, um, otherwise, otherwise in, in Charlottetown, it's also like paint the walls, redo the cabinets, replace the kitchen flooring. Um, there's one out in New Annan. Um, that tenant was being, it, it was very clear the tenant, the landlord was not acting in good faith, but the reasons given weren't very well explained. What usually happens is that the landlords don't explain the nature of the renovations very clearly. They try to just keep it as vague as possible because otherwise they have to prove that it's going to happen. Um, so usually you get very superficial, have to replace the walls or electricity or something like that. Mm -hmm. But they never say why or if it actually needs to be, just that they want to. And Chair, there's no requirement of proof from the landlord when they when they file for this. So so in the current legislation, which is what we have, because we don't have the new one, so we're still working with the old one, um, this current clause um, basically says you can renovate um, if the renovations cannot be carried out while the, le while the lessee, while the, the tenant occupies the premises. And that's it. It doesn't say prove it, doesn't say give us a permit, doesn't it? So that's what's happening. Where there is an action of bad faith, I cannot see, Chair, and I'd like to ask the Minister for, if he, for an intervention, how he would see this, this amendment being able to provide any additional um, um, protection for tenants more than the initial clause already does. 
because the, it's a rewording of what we already have. So it's taking one out and then putting it, the same thing back in again, <laughs> in my understanding. If I could ask for an intervention, if he feels he could do that. You, you can ask. I can yeah, ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, the floor to Minister of Social Development and Housing. Um, thanks, Chair. No, and um, I, I think I do understand the concern you're, you're bringing forward here. I really, uh, and so, so once again, um, what, what we're trying to do uh, is we're, we're trying to, to prevent the situation where you have a unit, uh, a rental that really it, it needs to be renovated. Um, and it needs to be renovated now. And, and the way that the, the current bill is, is, is worded, you cannot do renovations. And so this could destroy the property. This could impact the health and safety of persons. You know, and um, I, I mean, we, we, we had very brief conversations. <laughs> this, this just, we just briefed on this bill this morning. But um, it really, really, your bill relies on the landlord and the tenant coming to some sort of a, a agreement to make that happen. Um, and if you have a multi-unit building, you know, one tenant could disagree and then even though the other tenants agreed, you know, you can run into these scenarios. So the intent of this amendment is to make sure that in those situations where the building, you know, is going to be, you know, destroyed if the renovation is not done in a timely fashion, i.e. before the new Residential Tenancy Act is in place, or, um, the, the health and safety of the, the tenant themselves could be could be at risk or other other tenants they need to be able to make that renovation that's what that's that's the intent of this amendment and um, again um, uh, this was this was done obviously obviously quickly but I did I did uh, consult with the policy experts mm -hmm. in the department who've been working and, and picking apart this this act you know the the new act and really immersing themselves in this, you know, for, uh, you know, multiple hours every week, you know, working towards this new consultation draft, the Residential Tenancy Act, and, and this, and, and also consulting with, uh, with tenant groups and landlord groups, mm -hmm. and, and they, they said they, they really feel, and, and I really feel that this, this is needed so that we don't end up in these situations where property is destroyed or the safety of people is put at risk. So that's why I'm bringing it forward, and, and, uh, and, and, I, I think it will achieve that, and it will still allow um, the bad faith uh, renovations to be stopped. I really believe that. Um, I think it's, it's uh, with with your amendment combined with this one, it's more substantial than what was what's in the current act, and it's um, uh, you know. And in fact, I, I believe to go a step further, I believe that Iraq um, actually would stop bad faith rent evictions if given the chance. The problem is more of it's, it's more of a complaints based system that way where the, the appeal has to happen before they review the case. That what's going we're gonna we're gonna address that and fix that in, in, in the new act. So anyway that's where we're going with this. Uh, I, I believe that this amendment will achieve that. Um, and and that's that's where I'll let that stand, Chair. Thank you. Just very briefly, um, the the current Rental of Residential Property Act does not provide that provision of support for tenants currently. So tenants, tenants currently are living in unsafe situations because there is nothing that compels a landlord to actually do the repairs that are court required. And that is the case for the group that we're working with currently. There are landlords who are living in incredibly unsafe conditions. No, Minister, I'm speaking. And the... Um, um, and there is no requirement for them to be to be supported. Meanwhile, they can be evicted when there isn't an unsafe condition. And that's and that's actually the opposite of what we're trying to achieve. So, we if we had the new tenancy act, minister, this wouldn't be an issue. But we don't. So we're trying to address an immediate concern, which is to address tenants losing their place to live. Chair, if you wanted to go to other people for questions, uh, that would be I great. have an intervention thank from you. the minister of social development and housing. So thanks, chair. As we uh, we debate yeah. this uh, amendment. Um, so my, my, my question is really uh, to the, the, the sponsor of the bill is if there is a situation where there is a tenant that is in danger, if there's renovations don't occur, uh, occur it's going to impact their health and safety and, and it's an imminent, reno, in, imminent res, uh, renovations are needed, will the, the uh, amendment you're bringing to the Rental of Residential Properties Act allow those renovations to take place? Want to respond or you... Thank you. It's not the problem I'm trying to solve with this legislation. That's a problem that you're supposed to be solving with your legislation, and it's a problem that's been ongoing for 30 years. So it's not relevant to this discussion, Minister. 
uh, Minister of Social Development and Housing. So, so the problem is, Chair, um, if there is, and I used the two examples, uh, one was um, one was a flood in in an apartment, you know, where renovations are are needed immediately, and uh, otherwise, you know, it, it's it's basically unlivable. Um, Right now, the, this, this amendment doesn't allow that to happen. Uh, sorry, the, the changes that the sponsor is suggesting would not allow that renovation to occur. That's why I'm making this amendment, so that in those cases where you know, a renovation is needed imminently and right away, it can happen. And I'm not, and I'm not trying to, uh, to change the intent of the act. And, and um, again, Working with with the policy folks, I don't think it does change the intent. We're still there was the amendment. I think the the original um, intent is still intact, where it means um, people cannot be evicted in bad faith, and and the vast vast almost all renovations, renovations, evictions for renovations will be stopped. Um, but just in in these extreme cases where they're going to destroy the building or put the health and safety of persons at risk, will will. Um, Will they be allowed? That's what I'm going for, Chair. Do you want to respond? Or no. Okay, I'll move next on my list, uh, Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. And I thank the promoter for bringing this forward. I think this is an important piece of legislation, and I can tell you that I hear from people in Summerside who are impacted by renovations all the time. And I understand the concern that the minister is attempting to raise here, the idea that there could potentially be some necessary work that needs to be done. However, um, I don't believe that the amendment that you're bringing forward fully speaks to some of that. For starters, it's at the discretion of the landlord to say whether the work is necessary. Mm -hmm. There's no validation process. You don't have a list of what necessary work looks like. And there's no requirement in your amendment that after the renovation, the current tenant would have the first right of refusal to go back into that property. So if this is if this is intended to protect people, I feel like you're missing some components of it. There's another, and now granted, I've just gotten this amendment, so haven't had a lot of time to look at it, but even in the short amount of time that I've had to look at it, I can see that you have neglected to include things like that the landlord has secured necessary permits to go ahead with this work, because we've heard of lots of instances where renovations take place because the landlord intends to do renovations, and then those renovations never even happen. So I think it would be worth considering having um, the requirement that before this can happen, those necessary permits have already been applied for and received. I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on that, Minister. Intervention from the Minister of Social Development and Housing. Well, well, well thank you, Chair. And um, I, I did just first want to clarify that, um, you know, the, the current act actually does allow the tenant to file a complaint if, they, if they're evicted. And I think that's what the, the stranger works with, uh, with a lot, is helping them file those complaints. And the other thing is uh, this, this change, and this is, this is a, a good change, I think, uh, um, you know, it, to, to stop rent evictions until we get the new act in place is, is, is admirable, and, and I, I do support that. Um, so I, I, I think once that is in place, because that is the intent of this bill, I, that will be very clear to the administration, administrators of this legislation, which is IRAC, that renovations are, are to stop, right? And then this new amendment that I'm putting in is, a, is very much an exception clause. It's titled that there, number six. And, and IRAC will treat that as such. So that means renovations will be disallowed. Um, and any tenants out there who, who the landlord says, I'm going to renovate you know, your unit, well, can come forward and say, no, renovations are not allowed. And they should complain. Every single one of them should complain. And it's only in rare exceptions will, will IRAC have the ability to say, no, this, this can go ahead. And um, I, th I think it's very clear um, that it's to preserve the property to protect health and safety of persons. Again, these, these are the policy experts recommending that wording, and, and that's why I'm putting this amendment forward. Any response to your... Okay, Summer said Wilma. Thank you, Chair. I have to say that intervention didn't relate to what I said, so probably wasn't super necessary, but I'll just say <laughs> that 
there, yes, I'm aware there are an appeals process, but for people who have been evicted because there's going to be a renovation that takes place, they leave because that's a legal reason to evict someone, and then the renovation doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. it, th that absolutely happens all the time. If you don't know that, that's a problem because I'm that's sure the stranger on the floor about. would let you know that. That's a reality. So I am suggesting, you know, I'm actually going to make an amendment to the amendment. I am going to move that the amendment is amended by the addition of the word, the lesser has obtained the necessary permits and approvals required by law to complete the renovations, following the words um, health and safety of persons. Okay. I don't have copies of that because I didn't know this was coming. However, now we will take a brief recess to get that written down and pass out copies. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.
Okay, we are back in uh, Committee of the Whole House. Um, members, a copy has been distributed to each member. If one hasn't received it, please indicate and we'll have one given to you right away. Okay, the floor is now open for discussion on the amendment to the amendment and I have the leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for bringing this forward. Um, I just have an intervention to the minister and I understand where the member's uh, concern comes from. When are you anticipating the Residential Tenancy Act to be tabled on the floor of the legislature? Um, I'll have to, I know, I guess I know where you're going with this. Uh -huh. So if, if there's an intervention, I'll uh, acknowledge. Thank if you. not, we'll move on to the next question. Okay, an intervention from the Minister of Social Development and Housing. I'm, I'm hoping the open. We plan to have the consultation draft out before Christmas, and then we'll have the the legislation here for the uh, the winter slash spring sitting. The leader of the third party. So your intention is to have it for the spring sitting in February. Okay. So intervention from the Minister of Social Development and Housing. So, Chair, in the context of this bill, I mean, the the whole idea here is that um, you know by. You know, May, June time frame, uh, we'll have the, the new act in place and then we'll, the old act will be repealed, including the, uh, the amendment that uh, the sponsor is proposing today. Leader of the third party. Uh, uh, there seems, seems to be a lag in, to respect to the member that brought this bill forward, you know, like, but to, to her request, November 1st of 2023 is two years down the road to put a halt on things and we don't even have the new act yet. Like, you know, this is, this is trying to happen because we don't have the act. So it seems like a far out stretch. And has there been any consultation with Iraq, with tenants, with landlords? We're making amendments here that are good amendments, but has there been any contact with these three organizations? You're asking me? If you want to entertain it or... The, we, we have at, frequently reached out to Iraq on a number of different topics and they refuse to engage with us. They have made it clear that they don't feel that legislators from our space have um, any authority to request any um, import or update to regulations or legislation. So we um, are working on the basis of input from the people that we represent and work with. Um, and that, sorry, sorry. I just add that yeah. that time frame, um, obviously, as the minister mentioned, would be superseded by the legislation coming forward. We picked a date two years out on the basis that we obviously would expect to see that legislation, but we were told it would be here this fall. Okay. Leave it to third party. One other comment, it's more of a comment, but it could be deemed as a question. Like, sometimes I sit here and I wonder why is the Minister of uh, Social Services and Housing dealing with this when it falls under the Minister of Education, Iraq? Like, why isn't there any interventions? on that side of things, like, I mean, the Minister of Housing is, looks after government housing. He doesn't look after <laughs> housing across the province. So I, I wonder, like, why are, is everything being directed at him? And, uh, you know, there should be some more clarity on this. And I mean, I understand, totally understand the intent of this bill, but with the, you know, we were supposed to have a revised Residential Tenancy Act with input from everybody, landowners, mm -hmm. land, or landlords, tenants, and I would have hoped the representative mm -hmm. from Iraq. Yep. Well, we haven't seen it yet. If I, I can, I can speak to because I was involved in that original consultation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, both myself and my colleague, um, uh, our policy advisor and. Um, Nathan Hood, who you've seen before on the floor, back in December 2019. And the actual Residential Tenancy Act draft at that time was prepared by the Legislative um, Council for, from, for Iraq. So it was absolutely done, you know, with that expertise in mind and with extensive consultation. Um, and then was sent out to open consultation. They received a number of, um, of input from public and different bodies. So there actually has been that. And that's what we're using to inform the work that we've been doing because that's the only information that we have. Um, so I, I feel that this, you know, we don't know what's going to, what the next phase of that, but there certainly has been that, and, and, the, and the, the new legislation was developed from that, with that input in that context, which is what gives me confidence um, that I know, for example, that rent evictions and the issues around rent evictions and the good faith piece is actually addressed, or it was addressed in the original draft that I saw. It, I don't know if it'll still be there now. 
but, but it was because it was raised as a significant issue that was a gap. Um, and, and that gives me some confidence. Um, the trouble is that we're in a space now without that. And we have to find a way to bridge it in the meantime. As you heard, the, the impacts are, are really significant and ones that we can't continue to ignore. Okay. Leader of the third party. That's good for now, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Are there any further questions? Shall the amendment to the amendment carry? Carry. Carry. Okay. So we're back to the discussion on the amendment as amend amended. Carry. Question from the Minister of Social Development and Housing. The question. On oh, the sorry. Is there any further discussion on the amendment as amendment as amended? Sorry. Did you put your, your hand up too, or? Okay. Sorry. I thought you were indicating to me. Um, Charlton West Royalty. Just want to uh, just just say that this is an important. This is an important piece in our area and where we live, and I want to thank the, the mover for bringing it forward. And um, this has happened to people in my community, and I just want to make sure that this, this goes far enough until we get new legislation in, because this is a, this is a huge, huge problem in, in Prince Edward Island. And um, as I'm sitting here thinking, I'm, I'm just thinking about <laughs> In, in this, in this we, have, we have the protection of uh, the pres preserve the property before the health and safety of a person in this amendment, which is just completely, uh, it's, it's, it's backwards. I mean, it's just wording, but it's important. And this is really all about um, people during a crisis. And I, I think that this is a, a good piece of legislation to provide some um, some relief to some desperate, desperate people in our in our community. So I, I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Member. You're welcome, Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, I guess the main, the goal of this this piece of legislation is that we want the co the seemingly common practice of knocking on doors and slapping an eviction notice to stop. Um, and so, you know, if it's in good faith then um, landlords would accommodate and help um, renters find a temporary location while they conducted those renovations mm -hmm. and then would offer the first right of refusal back to the renters. Um, you know, we want the renovations, we don't, the, we don't want rent renovations to stop, we want renovations to stop. And so, you know, I, I, I guess, I will support the amendment because anything at this point would be better to keep people in their homes and to put their health and safety above, um, you know, um, bad faith. Is that what I'm trying to say? Um, so I guess I, I don't so much have a question, but I guess um, I, I would ask in your, would this amendment, is this amendment going to um, achieve the, the goal? here it is the best we can do in the circumstances we 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 have heard um, from Connor that the um, this is hugely impactful um, and what this um, the primary goal of this is to find breathing space so that the current wave of run evictions and the fear and the stress of am I going to be next to have the notice on my door will stop until we can bring forward legislation that would include first right of refusal, would include more clear um, obligations on landlords and will put the health and safety of tenants first. Um, in the interim, the requirement, this requirement, this additional amendment helps emphasize the need for this to be happening in good faith because it requires them to show some proof. It still puts the onus on the tenant to have to go forward though and that's still a huge stress so I am concerned that what will happen now is we're just going to see more complicated statements of renovation but I do think that this sends a very clear message to government, to Iraq and to landlords and tenants that we are paying attention. And I think that's what makes it worth it. So it's the best we can do right now, and that's better than nothing at all, and that's what Islanders need us to do. Charlotte on Victoria Park. Good, thank you, Chair. Okay, shall the amendment as amendment, as amended, sorry, carry? Carry. 
Okay, we're back to discussion on the um, bill as amended. Carry the bill. Shall the bill carry? Carry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Corner's like, a, can I go? <laughs> I move the title. An act to amend the rental of residential property act shall carry. I move the enacting clause. Be it enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair and that the Chair report the bill agreed to with amendment. Shall it carry? Chair of the Committee of the Hall House, having under consideration the bill to be intentional, an act to amend the rental of the Residential Property Act, I beg leave to report the Committee has gone through the said bill, has agreed the same, with amendment. I move the report of the Committee be adopted. Should I carry? The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford, the Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the, the Leader of the Official Opposition that the 36th order of the day be now read. Shaw Carey. 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 Order 36, an act to amend the Election Expenses Act, Bill Number 121, order for second reading. The Honourable Member for Mermaid Stratford, the Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Leader of the Official Opposition that the said bill be now read a second time. Shaw Carey. 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 Bill number 121, an act to amend the Election Expenses Act, read a second time. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford, the Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Leader of the Official Opposition that this House do now resolve itself into a Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Sure, Carey. 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 The Honourable Member from Tignish Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker, the Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please. Now, in a committee of the whole house to take into consideration a bill to be in titual an act to amend the election expenses act. A request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? Good afternoon. Would you please state your name and position for Hansard? Uh, Patrick Levesque, Principal Secretary in the Official Opposition Office. Thank you very much and welcome. Um, Promoter, would you like to commence with a brief statement on the Bill's intent? I'd appreciate that. Thank you, Chair. So, <coughs> democracy, like most ventures, requires money. Political parties need money and candidates need money in order to be able to fully participate fairly in the democratic process. 
So to protect the delicate flower of democracy, to borrow a phrase from a previous premier of this province, it's necessary that any money that flows through our democracy does not distort the process and is properly accounted for. Democracy is harmed when those with the power that comes from having lots of money try to exert that power in the democratic process by using their money. All jurisdictions around the world regulate how money interacts with the democratic process, and here on PEI we do that through the Election Expenses Act. And this bill aims to amend the Election Expenses Act to address four specific issues. Firstly, it introduces provisions to regulate loans to political parties, which is currently absent from our Election Expenses Act, and Prince Edward Island is the only province that has no provisions to regulate loans. Secondly, it requires political parties su to submit audited annual financial information, and again, PEI is the only province that currently does not require this. Thirdly, the bill lowers the election expense limit to bring it in line with other provinces, and currently Prince Edward Island is more than double the next highest province when it comes to election expense limits. And fourth, this bill allows for small anonymous donations of under $25 to be made, and that's similar to the so-called cupcake bill that was introduced in this House in 2018 by former Speaker Kathleen Casey. So I look forward to debate on what I think are important changes to this Act and that will help to ensure fair and open elections on PEI for many years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. You're very welcome. Is the Pleasures Committee of the bill be now read clause by clause, section by section, or open it up to, as a whole for questions? Okay. So we are now open for discussion. Uh, Morel Dona. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, uh, Member, for bringing this bill forward, and, and I appreciate the, uh, the previous uh, briefing as well, and I understand you have made uh, changes uh, since that briefing. Would you mind speaking to some of the changes you've made and the reasons why? Sure. So, first, I, I want to thank Morel Dona um, for being an active part of the discussions around the, the formation of this bill. Um, I perhaps will take this opportunity to thank also the Legislative Management Committee for very <laughs> quickly meeting this morning in order to come forward with a recommendation that this bill come to, to the House for Committee of the Whole for second reading and the many other people that, we've, that we have uh, consulted with during the, the, the fabrication of this bill. So I do not have the previous iteration of the Election Expenses Act changes that we were going to make, but I think the stranger does, so he can speak to that. Um, I have a previous version, so um, I may ask you to help remind me um, um, you know what, what particular uh, ones, issues we discussed. Okay. Morel Dona. That, that's it's probably an unfair question. I, I didn't mean to phrase it like that because we're discussing yeah. this bill currently. So uh, yeah. I guess I should have said, you know, the, I appreciate the, the the effort and the changes. In that discussion, I had uh, started by saying, I, when I read the bill the first time, I really got the feeling of you were trying to eliminate loans to political parties. I still have a bit of that feeling, certainly not as much based on the changes that came, and I felt that was uh, I felt that was an un, un personally an unfair tone kind of thing. So I guess I'll, I'll say, I'll, my first question is, uh, Elections PEI puts forward an annual report each year where they ask rec for recommendations, they ask for changes. This has never been part of that. Um, uh, but you're bringing forward this. Where is it coming from? So this came forward through actually a jurisdictional scan originally when it became clear that Prince Edward Island is a real outlier when it comes to regulating loans and the other aspects and report, particularly loans and reporting requirements. And so the motivation was really just to bring Prince Edward Island into line with, with the other provinces and the federal government. If I could, Chair. Yeah, sure. Um, and thank you, Morel Dona, for jogging my memory there. Um, uh, the, uh, part of our discussion, we had looked at, I know, the um, guaranteeing of loans, and we did make a change there. Um, to ensure that um, someone who guarantees a loan can still continue to make uh, contributions, uh, <coughs> donations every year uh, under the Act. Um, and I'll also add, and it's, it's not a, a, a change specifically in, in the legislation, but I did do a little bit more research on um, um, whether um, the sort of uh, the, the guarantee provisions here 
uh, would um, possibly uh, impede parties from taking out loans. And um, I, I will note that provisions along the lines of what we have here are present in several other provinces and federally. So clearly, they're not impeding loans being taken out in uh, by federal parties or in other provinces. So I'm pretty confident that uh, this will not impede parties here from taking out loans. Or Aldona. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Patrick. I, I don't know if I should jump to that one or what I should do. Um, uh, let's continue on that trend of, about the guarantors. Um, so you're saying other jurisdictions, so I'll, I'll speak about uh, the legislation brings into into play. I just want to get the, the right section here because I'm jumping ahead on the guarantors. It would be the Four, new 16, six. proposed 16.1 sub 6. Yeah. So what you're proposing is then if a political party uh, goes to a bank, um, they would have to have guarantees. Here. Um, so what this bill, this bill does not require parties to have uh, a guarantor for their loan, for a loan. Right. Um, and as far as I, I can tell, neither does, I, I don't think any other province does either. Um, so this, there's no requirement to have a guarantor, but there's an option to have a guarantor. Mm -hmm. um, and if you do, then there are certain stipulations that have to be followed in that process. Right. Morel Dona. And so if a party was in a, a, a time of not being well off kind of thing, they would have to seek guarantors to maybe uh, get that loan? Um, that would be um, largely, um, I would think, up to the, the financial institution from which they're um, receiving the loan. Right. Uh, some financial institutions may require guarantors, some may not. It, it may depend on a whole variety of factors. But we kind of leave that to the financial institutions to determine. How they how they would offer an, a loan to any organization? You know they have to assess their their risk and and that sort of thing. Or Aldona. So uh, I'll, I'll back it up to so the first part of the bill I, I think is is uh, personally I think is is is, is quite good. Uh, the the whole point about not uh, uh, loaning money to people and then if you forgave that loan. Uh, and it not being counted as a, as a contribution to a party. I think that is legitimate, it makes sense. I actually agree with that. Um, but when we get into some of the other uh, parts of it, I, I, I have questions. So about the, the guarantors again. Um, if you're going to take out a three or four or $500,000 loan uh, for an election that say was called uh, by a, a government quickly, I don't, I just I don't see a financial institution trying to uh, have the administration of coming up with 150 guarantee guarantors or doing the administration that has to deal with 150 guarantors to a $3,100 a, a pop to guarantee that loan. And I, I guess what is why why limit that if we can't forgive the loan anyway as a donation? Why would we limit this? I'm not entirely sure I follow. Um, as I mentioned before, there is no requirement for a party to have guarantors to take out a loan, so it's entirely quite likely that parties, and I mean, I, I believe there, there might even be a province that does not allow individuals to guarantee loans, period. So you can, parties can only take out loans um, without guarantors th through the normal um, um, process through a financial institution. So, um, if the party, if, if for whatever reason, you know, it, it might, I, I suppose, an, a financial institution might determine if the, the level of risk is higher for whatever reason that they might ask for guarantors for a portion of a loan or something, but that would be up to the institution to determine that based on, you know, as I mentioned before, the risk, market conditions, all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff that they deal with. Morel Dona? And you're right. But what you're saying is that you should only be allowed to guarantee your maximum contribution in, in that year. Yes. So my question is why? Right. So the 
Um, the reason for that is if um, a party were to default on the loan and the financial institution then goes to a guarantor and says, you know, you're the guarantor on this loan, you have to pay, um, the, we're going to, uh, they're going to seek that, th uh, those funds from you, then that, because it's, it's a roundabout way, it, it's in, in effect what's happening is that individual is paying off the loan of the party which uh, we in this legislation and is common in most other provinces call, uh, determines that to be a contribution. So because of that, uh, we want to make sure that a, a guarantor is not held on the hook for an amount that's more than the amount they're allowed to contribute in a year. I.e., we want to make sure that the, a loan guarantor who has to pay on a loan doesn't end up paying, say, $10,000, which is well above the uh, contribution limits. More Aldona. Thank you, Chair. So uh, today um, we had the uh, CEO, I believe, of Elections BEI in. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm going to switch to uh, which section. Let's go to, so everybody found along. The annual filing of audited financial information in uh, section 20. Um, so he had talked about uh, if these uh, <coughs> annual filings were given to him, um, it alludes to proving the audited financial statements proves that the parties are uh, have the principles in place to catch things according to the GAAP um, accounting principles. Um, it doesn't have, on face, doesn't, he, he had said it doesn't do it justice for the uh, Elections Expense Act and that he'll have to go through that stuff anyway to make sure that the everything is done appropriately. Um, if Elections PEI is saying that uh, audit financial statements don't give them everything they need, why should we go to, you know, other than the fact that everybody else is doing it, why do we need to go to that? And I asked that in the question as if you were a small political party and you have to pay for your audit financial statements each year. It's an expense and you have to go through that. So if Elections PEI says they, they, that doesn't give them exactly what they need to do their reviewing anyway, why would we require it? So I, I think I would start by answering that question by reiterating what I said at the beginning, which is that in terms of reporting requirements, PEI is way out of line with, with the other provinces. The other provinces who do require reporting on larger parts of political expenses and fundraising, which is essentially what Section 20 captures, mm -hmm. uh, they all require audited financial statements in the same way that you've just described. And absolutely audited financial statements, and as Tim said, this morning when he was here before Legislative Management Committee, um, they are perhaps, um, one gets the impression that an audited financial statement is something that you can absolutely hang your hat on and be sure that all of the details required are there. And he says that's not the case. Um, and that's not just the, 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 the accounting firms on PEI, let me be clear about that. These are done by very, very noteworthy, uh, completely trustworthy accounting firms. But an audited financial statement is not the same as a forensic accounting statement. And what Tim said this morning was that the statements that they currently get, which are audited financial statements, the only ones they get are during an election period. And parties are mandated to present audited financial statements around elections. So for the D16 by-election, for example, all the parties are mandated to provide audited financial statements. And Elections PEI has found that those audited financial statements are, he said, every time have errors in them. And so it's typically Stephanie in his office that does this. She'll spend an awful lot of time going through those audited financials to make sure that they are accurate. And they almost never are. So what he said this morning was, yes, we're presenting, we're, if this bill passes, we will be coming forward with a lot more information from the parties to elections PEI. And he was happy about that. He said, and he said this morning, I'm in favor of that. But he also um, acknowledged that if we are to do a 
proper audit and, rely, and not rely entirely on, on the uh, audited statements from, uh, from auditors, that that will present some work for elections PEI. This bill, I should say, does not mandate that. There's nothing in the bill that compels elections PEI to do that. Tim is just saying audited financial statements may have errors in them. And because he is really concerned about looking after public funds accurately, and I respect that, that he feels that it would be prudent, I think was the word that he used this morning, for elections PEI to do a further audit on this, which would incur extra work for them and perhaps even extra cost. Um, just a couple of things to add to that. I, I, I want to make it clear that, if, I mean, I wasn't there for the discussion this morning, but I've had this discussion with the chief electoral officer uh, before when we met with him. And um, I don't think they're saying that, you know, the statements that they receive are completely false. You know, there's a few little errors here and there. Sometimes it's just um, an individual um, that has donated twice during the year and one time they, you know, might even just be a spelling mistake in the name. And so the, that appears as two separate ones, so they have to consolidate the two. You know, it's just oftentimes it's just little things like that, but they, um, you know, um, I, I don't want to give the impression that, you know, the audited statements it. that are, are submitted now are, you know, not, uh, well, you know, the, they're, they're not falsified, def definitely not, and they're not, um, they're not like riddled with errors. You know, there's a, f you know, mistakes get made. Uh, the second thing is um, to to um, build on um, what the, the leader said there on the chief electoral officer's responsibilities. So under the, the Election Expenses Act, in another section that we're not amending here today, um, the, the the chief electoral officer has the responsibility to examine, um, it's in section three of the act, to examine all financial returns filed with the chief electoral officer. So that is the extent of the requirement there, is to examine those records. Um, you know, it's just kind of, I think, um, just to kind of do the due diligence, um, but it's how that's done is up to, to them. Moral Dona. Thank you, Chair. Um, am I still alone on the list? So I'll go to the, um, oh, sorry, yeah, while we're still in this section. So uh, there's filing audit financial statements with the office, and there's publishing the statements as well. Why did you choose to uh, file it and publish it? Uh, or ask them to? So, Chair? Yep. So, my understanding is that this would compel all parties to provide to elections PEI annual audited statements of all of their financial affairs. And the only responsibility actually that this act compels elections PEI to do is to publish that publicly so that so that islanders can see. Am I am I missing your question here? No. Well, Moral Dona? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I guess I'm 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 thinking in the in the instance where so there we Maybe I should ask too, uh, like if there's other places that you have to file it, but, election, but the, they don't necessarily publish it. They're mm -hmm. just okay with it. And I'm trying to think of a political example where you have a government in power and they see that parties are flailing financially and they call it a snap election because the other parties have, aren't in a good space financially. I, I get that that's an extreme example, but I'm trying to think, are there other spots that you have to file it, but you don't necessarily have to publish it? So the requirement um, to uh, publish uh, documents is the best practice across the country. I'm not sure if it's in absolutely every province, but certainly most. Um, it's really it's it's to provide that uh, openness and transparency to to uh, you know the citizens of the province is is the primary reason for that. Moral Dona. Thank you, Chair. The. Uh, Section it's not five. <coughs> Bear with me here. It's on the uh, per vote amount. Just trying to think of the proper section for it. I think you're thinking section five, which is it's the five, but it's not five. Eighteen. 
the new or uh, the amendment to s subsection 181. Is that what it is 181? I think that's what. Yeah. It, okay. Assuming I'm reading your yeah, mind correctly. Yeah, subsection 18 of the act is amended by the deletion of the words uh, six and substitution of the words a dollar seventy five. Um, I, uh, I I guess I disagree with this one. Um, uh, you had quoted uh, to me about Newfoundland was the next closest one to us. Why do you think Newfoundland is higher than the rest of the provinces? I mean, that, that's a that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know the answer, and I know Pat did speak with uh, the. No. Oh, you, you did reached out to uh, the folks in Newfoundland. Um, I could not answer that. Morel donuts. And, and I, I'm going to wager that it has to do with the fact that as political parties um, in election year or not there's a base level of, of things that you, you're providing as a party not unlike you know we talk about how our expenses here in PEI for health care is or for providing health services is you have to provide the hospital regardless of how many people are going through it kind of thing and the base level of funding that a party needs to to spend to do that um, I think is is a strong reason why we should have a much higher uh, per elector number than than elsewhere. Um, our our population, our districts are just so much smaller than other provinces where they say you know one per hundred thousand, so so much per hundred thousand people in a district, or one per so much you know for for or for the the entire province if you break it down. So I think that's an important part that that I. I, I disagree with. Um, the other thing is, I, you know, it's very it's very rare that we would that that parties would ever spend to that max. I, I, I'm trying to think of like two off the top of my head that it's ever been ever been done. But do you do you understand? Does that make sense to you that because of our size that we should have a, a much higher? Go first, Pat. <laughs> okay. Um, so a couple of things. So yeah, um, Newfoundland and Labrador is the next highest uh, province in terms of spending. Oh, the uh, first thing I should s specify. So this spending limit applies. It's the spending limit during an election. Right. So it doesn't apply outside of elections. Just to clarify that. Thank you. Uh, so Newfoundland and Labrador is the next highest at. 476 um, this year. Um, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick are um, both significantly lower at two point, Nova Scotia at 266, New Brunswick 208. Um, and just to clarify for the rest of members here that the, while this bill substitutes the number 175, that number is indexed to the um, to inflation on b based on 1995. That's what's currently in the act. So that actually uh, will be 285. So if you compare that to, um, you know, we, we would still be higher than both no uh, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, and um, not quite as high as Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, you know. I feel like I have opinions here, but it's, I it, probably it, it, shouldn't it, it, get it's into it. Opinion, plain and um, the um, I, I think you want yeah, to say yeah, sure. something as well. Sure, uh, I, I think that's a valid argument, uh, uh, Morel Don. Excuse me. Um, the idea of economies of scale, but I also think a counter argument to that, and an equally powerful one, is that politics here on PEI, because of the size of our districts, is actually a very intimate thing. You know, it's knocking on doors, it's going to speak to people, and that we actually rely less on the financial aspect of politics here than perhaps bigger jurisdictions do, where the chances of an elector actually meeting with her or his um, candidate is is much less so I feel that the economies of scale in the hospital uh, uh, example that you used in terms of delivering services I totally agree with you on that that PEI sometimes is is at a disadvantage because of that but we're not talking here about providing a service that costs money we're talking about the electoral democratic process which actually I would argue is made stronger when we do not rely on money in fact perhaps the 
the whole central purpose of this bill is to limit the influence of money on politics, as I said in my introduction. So I, I, I get the argument. I'm just not sure it's applicable in this instance. I, I would also just add to that that um, um, in terms of just from the, the in terms of geography, like um, in the smaller size of our ridings, it's much easier to get around. Um, um, you think if you think of some other jurisdictions like, you know, Northern Ontario or Labrador or something where there are communities that you cannot drive to or, you know, that are that you have to access by f flight only. It's obviously going to be a lot more expensive to campaign in these very large uh, rural districts, whereas um, in PEI, you know, you can drive from one end to the other of the largest riding in under an hour, right? Disagree, but... <laughs> <laughs> Honourable Members, we've reached a time allotted for time other than government. I'll ask the promoter to um, okay. report progress. We're okay to keep going. Do we have to take a break from here or do we keep going? Keep going. Okay. So apparently there's a consensus among the caucuses to keep uh, moving forward with this bill, so we're going to continue on. Uh, Morel Dona. Um. Yeah, I guess I just I, I disagree. I, I don't think going back down to a dollar seventy-five, which is more than I get it with inflation, to, to two eighty-five, uh, uh, is uh, an appropriate baseline amount to, to run uh, a campaign in, in Prince Edward Island. We have different types of media buys here. Like you know, I think we have a, 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 a just a disagree. You know, I, I because we don't hit our our max very often. I could understand trying to bring that back down, but bringing it back down to a dollar seventy-five for each of the uh, district and the provincial, I just I just disagree with. Um, do I know where that sweet spot is? No. But it's it's certainly not back down to a dollar seventy-five is 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 my uh, thoughts on that. I have a, another question on the end of the bill. I'm twenty-six one uh, uh, subsection 2, contravening loan is null and void, which states on the summary conviction of a registered party, registered candidate, or potential candidate under subsection 1, the contravening loan is null and void. How do you, wouldn't a bank be concerned about that? How, how do you make a loan null and void to a bank? Um, so if I could first just, um, make one final comment on what we were just discussing before that on the um, the party spending limit um, that the it's important to note that um, that limit is the limit for parties but candidates still spend on top of that so um, um, this is not affecting you know there's still party and candidates still can spend up to that limit separately um, as to the offense um, so this is one that we changed from the earlier draft. Um, we were initially looking at making the offense apply to a financial institution. Uh, we decided to change it to um, focus on the, the offense being for the party uh, or, um, or can, uh, candidate if, if that's how it um, uh, that's how the contravention uh, contravention happens. Uh, that the fine be be there rather than on the finan financial institution. The challenge then becomes um, so the contravening loan being null and void. If a party um, does not. Um, um, so the idea here is if a party receives a, a loan illegally, so first of all, in, in the earlier part of that section, they have to uh, pay a penalty in the amount of the loan. In other words, they have to um, return the money or, or hand the money over to the, the operating fund, to the Minister of Finance. Um, and, but then we would not want them to then be s still liable for that loan to the bank. So 
so that they're not hit twice. So this um, ensures that if a party yeah, is not hit twice by both the penalty and still having to pay the loan. Um, it also provides a little bit of, um, uh, it, not an offense, but a consequence for a financial institution that um, if the, that uh, you know they will they may not get all their money back. So it's it's while it's not an offense, it's still a bit of an incentive for them to ensure they're following the the rules. Morel Dona. Um, th thanks, Chair. Um, are we are we allowed to can 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 we say that someone can't doesn't have to pay back the bank as legislators? I have to consult with. Um, yeah, I'm. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, like it. Uh, I think I'm understanding. It. Like we're saying that the contravening loan is null and void. I don't know how we can say that the loan that you have with that financial institution is null and void. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I I I think from my understanding um, this works, but um, yeah, I just have one more question. Sure. Are you finished? Here? Okay. Donna? Um, it, it's just a, an overall question. I had asked election PEI today when they bring changes to the Elections Act or, or, or their own act, if they reach out to the parties um, and they said they do reach out to the official agents. Um, I don't think. Have you have you reached out to the to, to the parties? Uh, we reached out to the caucus offices, uh, and therefore through the offices to the parties. Now, uh, we had a, we reached out to an, a number of people. I won't go. I won't go through the list uh, or Mayor Aldona, but when it comes to contacting the parties, we did reach out through the caucus offices. We've also pub published this publicly. Um, and again, I, I come back to the fact that these are the provisions of this legislation are what is mandated in every other province. We're not creating anything above and beyond what all other provinces essentially do. And so we, and presumably official agents in those provinces have no problem complying with this. So I, I'm comfortable that this is not going to create any duress for uh, official agents here on PEI. Moraldona? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, like, it's, you don't have to reach out to the parties, but I, I wouldn't say that reaching out to our caucus is reaching out to the political mm -hmm. arm of, of our party. Mm -hmm. uh, have you talked to the NDP, or the other registers, or have you talked to all registered parties outside of the elected caucuses? I don't believe so. I believe the NDP is the only other par registered party currently on Prince Edward Island, other than the ones who are represented in this legislature suit. Uh, Meral Dona, my apologies, Chair. Meral Dona? That was my and, question. Have you, right. have you reached out to the to the NDP party? I do not believe so. Meral Dona? I'm, I'm good for right now. Leader of the third party. Thank you. So I wasn't quite clear on that answer. So did you reach out to any other political parties? We reached out to the caucus offices here. But we did not reach out to the NDP. But you didn't reach out to the third party. Yeah. So um, I don't mean Cox's offices. I mean the party. No. Arm. So you haven't reached out to any parties, Liberal, Conservative, NDP. No. Just your own. Just the caucus office. Just the caucus office. Okay. We do the third party. The money that that's given back to uh, each district from elections PEI. Explain that and what that money's for per vote. Um, are you referring to the per vote subsidy? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, that's not in the scope of this bill, so I'm not quite sure. Okay, it's not sure in there then? To... Leader of the third party? Okay. Can you explain to me? I think I know, but I'd like to hear it explained for the purpose of the legislature the difference between your audits, your, like the forensic audit and the other audit you discussed, and the monetary difference, because there would be quite a monetary difference, would there not? I, I can answer that um, in that I, I don't know the answer to that. I do know that the 
what Tim referred to as a forensic audit, I think covers a wide spectrum of, of auditors don't do just one, you know, one of two things. They do do a whole bunch of things. So I'm not sure where on that spectrum the sort of audit he was suggesting would be carried out. Yes, it would cost money, but I, I couldn't tell you exactly how much. Leader of the third party. Thank you. So there's nothing in this bill, any provisions to re remunerate the parties for any added expenses no. that it would cost in this audit? It, the costs would be incurred by the parties. By the party. Leader of the third party. So then we're trying to curtail their fundraising and add more expenses to the parties. Um, there's no, there are no provisions in this bill related to fundraising, yeah. I think, other than loans. Leader of the third uh, party. So there's just loans is the only provision as far as fundraising? Uh, well, sorry, there's also the, um, um, the anonymous, the, it opens up anonymous contributions as well. So that's, that's an increasing, I guess, the capacity there. Could you explain that a little further, please? Uh, so currently under the um, Election Expenses Act, um, there, uh, it, anonymous contributions are completely prohibited. So under this act, and this is the, what um, the leader referred to as the, the cupcake bill um, that was proposed uh, a few years ago, uh, we are proposing to allow anonymous contributions of up to $25 to be made um, so that um, basically it allows, say, if a party were having a bake sale or a, a small, small uh, event that uh, it, it doesn't put um, like a burden of, of paperwork to file receipts for you know little tiny donations. Leader of the third party. So you could donate without a receipt of twenty five dollars. Yeah. So a thousand people could donate twenty five dollars. Yeah. Leader of the third party. Okay. And and as far as the spending amounts, so you say ours is capped at two eighty five. That's, Chair, that's current dollars based on the CPI since the 175 was introduced. So the leader of the third party? So what you mean by that is that's all a party is going to be allowed to spend? So there are two, and maybe it's a good opportunity to get this on the record, there are per vote subsidies, uh, sorry, per vote limits that parties are permitted to spend up to, and there's a per vote limit for a candidate and a per vote limit for the party. And what this bill tries to do is to make those equal. So 285, I think it is, yeah. per, uh, per voter for the candidate and 285 per voter for the party. And those are, those are two separate ways that, that, that uh, parties can spend money. And I, I will note on that point that PEI is, the, is I, I believe, the only province where the party limit is higher than the candidate limit. And where you know, it's several times higher right now. So. Every other province, they're either the same or the party has a lower limit than the candidate. Leader of the third party. So, you, so a party would be allowed to pay to spend five hundred seventy thousand uh, dollars. I don't have the math in front of me, but I think that works out. Those two, two, yes, two eighty-five and two eighty-five. Yeah. Leader of the third party. That's it for now. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Minister, I'm, uh, you, I do have you on my list. Minister of Fisheries <coughs> and Communities. Thank you, Chair. Just don't want to clarify something that. Uh, Morel Dona mentioned, and you said about he asked the question if this would affect a bank or how. I don't understand how we can bring in a law uh, that would that would impose something against a, feder a fed federally regulated identity because all banks are regulated by the federal government. So how can we pass something that could affect a federal regulated identity? Now, my understanding is, of that federal law, is that federal regulation that applies to banks doesn't apply to some credit unions, some trust companies, um, I think some private investment companies, and also private banks that are to a select membership. So how, would, how, can, you, how can we pass a law that goes against a federal regulated company? Um, so I, I don't think this actually it creates any sort of regulatory implications for a bank. It's not a regulatory implication. It's, but if we're, um, imposing, if we're imposing on an institution, if I take out a loan 
and the act allows me allows the the law to get rid of the loan, I don't have to I can default, I haven't got to pay on it. Why would that institution ever agree to loan money to a political party? I mean, I would argue that's the case right now. But I would argue that we can't make a law against a uh, the contravening something that's in the federal government under a regulated platform that they they manage and regulate. I'm I'm sorry, but I, I'm I'm not. Could you clarify what is actually being contravened, Minister of Fisheries and Communities? Well, if if I understand what the conversation was before, is that if 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 I go and borrow money on behalf of a political party. Maybe I got that wrong. If I go in and I borrow money from a financial institution, the BMO will say, to fund a political party or an election, are you not saying that your law or your act would allow me to default on that loan and there's nothing the government or nothing the bank could do about it? It's going back to your contravening loan is null and void. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Can't answer that, Matt. Okay. Minister of Fisheries and Communities? That's enough for now. I think I've made my point. Okay. Any further discussion? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Summerside yeah. Wilma. Thank you, Chair. So I, I would just love to respond to that quickly if I could. I suppose my question for you is Is this law in place in any other province? Um, I mean, the bill as a whole, no. Uh, but, but this section? This particular section. So the first part of the section regarding the, yeah, the offenses is basically there. Um, I believe, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm sorry, but I, I've been trying to find it, but I, I'm pretty sure I've seen provisions in other provinces where uh, a, a loan can be nullified. Uh, I can't find the exact example in front of me, but I believe I have seen it. Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Chair. It just seems to me that uh, you're asking how we can regulate this, and I would have to say it's the same way that you would bring in a law that regulates a separate branch of government, like the judiciary. I mean, it's not, it's not outside the scope of what's constitutionally possible, and if other provinces have done this, I, I suppose I'm curious why it would be problematic in our province if it isn't in others. I don't well, I do. Yeah, I, I, I don't have it in front of me. In front of us. Apologize. Summerside Wilmot? Uh, I'm good for there. Thank you. Any, for, any further questions? Shall I carry? Carry. Okay, I'm going to have to ask all those in favor of this bill, Carrion, please raise your hand. All those opposing and not in favor of this bill, Carrion, please raise your hand. Thank you very much. The nays have it. Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the Chair and that the Chair report the bill not recommended. Shall I carry? As Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having on a consideration of the bill to be intitled an act to amend the Election Expenses Act, I beg leave to report that the Committee has gone through the said bill and, and does not recommend same to the Legislative Assembly. I move that the report of the Committee be adopted. Shall I carry? 
The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford and the Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I seek unanimous consent to call Order 35 to third reading. Honourable Members, does she have unanimous consent? Yes. yes. Honourable Member, you have unanimous consent. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't quite sure there. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by the Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford, that the 35th order of the day be now read. Shall I carry? Carry. An act to amend the Rental of Residential Property Act, Bill Number 122, read a third time. Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by the Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford, that the said bill be now read a third time. Should I carry? Carry. Oh, right okay. Sorry. <laughs> bill number 122, an act to amend the re rental of residential property act, read a third time. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford that the said bill do now pass. <laughs> Honourable Members, this is a bill introduced by leave of the House read a first time, read a second time, committed to a committee of the whole house, reported, agreed to, with amendment, read a third time, it is now moved that the bill do not pass. All those in favor say yay. Yay. All those contrary, nay. Honorable member, bill has passed tremendously. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Land, Justice, Public Safety, and the Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, I move second by the Honourable Minister of Finance and Deputy Premier that the pursuant to Section 4.10 of the Provincial Court Act to report the report of the Judicial Remuneration Review Commission dated October 21st, 2021, and is tabled on October 29th, 2021, to be adopted. Shall I carry? The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move second by the Minister of uh, Environment, Energy, and Climate Action that the 27th order of the day be now read. Shall it carry? Order 27. An act to amend the Planning Act number two, Bill number 43, ordered for second reading. The Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move second by the Minister of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action that the said bill be read a second time. Sure, I care. Bill number 43, an act to amend the Planning Act number two, read a second time. The Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Minister of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action that this House did not resolve itself in a committee. The whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Sheila Carey. The Honorable Member from Tignish Pomeroy, Deputy Speaker, to chair the committee of the whole House, please.
Bill to be intitled an act to amend the Planning Act number two. A request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? Please state your name and position for Hansford. Yes, Andrea Triolo, Senior Legislative and Applied Research Analyst, Agriculture and Land. Thank you very much and welcome. Honourable members, uh, we are currently discussing this bill openly. Um, so I'm just going to start a new no. list again today. I can't find my list from yesterday. So no, 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 anyone no. that wants to get on the list, please. This is a new bill. Oh, sorry. Oh, it is. It's a... Uh, my apologies. My apologies. We're I rushed all, in and I guess I wasn't thinking. We're all human here. Brand new one. Okay. So, I'm going to start. We're, we're very for, <laughs> yeah. We're very forgiving around here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, promoter, would you like to begin by giving just a general <laughs> statement on the bill's intent? Sure, I will. Okay. Uh, an act to amend the Planning Act. These amendments are being introduced to address the recommendations by the Land Matter Advisory Committee and will bring clear purpose to outline the scope of the act, as well as introduce statement of provincial interest to help guide land planning on PEI. Uh, Mr. Chair, during the debate on the LPA amendments, I had the opportunity to thank the Lands Matter Committee for the work that led those to those amendments. I would like to take the time again to thank them for the hard work and recommendations that uh, led to these changes we are bringing forward today. Uh, the recommendations made by Islanders, for Islanders, will help us, uh, our island now and into the future. Thank you very much. Uh, members, is it the wish of the committee that the bill be now read clause by clause or section by section or open as a whole? Okay, I will now start my list. Any questions? Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Minister. Thank you, Andrea, for being here. So I guess my first question is that of the um, 13 recommendations from the, the committee you just cited, Minister, six of them had to do with the Land Use Planning Act, and I'm wondering how many of the recommendations from the Land Matters Committee are being fulfilled with this legislation? So the amendments are um, directly addressing Recommendation 7, parts of Recommendation 7. It's a fairly lengthy recommendation yep. uh, where we're, bringing, we're clarifying the purpose of the Act and we're bringing in the statements of provincial interest. Um, the statements of provincial interest are also going to be a first step to address Recommendations 9, 6, and 11 as it relates to land use policies. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. Sorry, Ms. 9... 9, 6, and 11. Right. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, so really this is a, laying the groundwork for the sort of heavy lifting, if I can put it that way, of yeah. the regulatory and legislative changes that have, have to take place. This is more a statement of purpose. It's a statement of purpose and there are statements of provincial interest that were developed by planners. As was indicated by planners, this is really a first step in getting, as you say, sort of the heavy work done. Okay. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks. So looking at number seven, recommendation number seven, which is, uh, as you said, Andrea, where the bulk of, the, of this uh, applies, I'm gonna, just going to read out that the provincial government review and consider implementing the significant body of work completed to address gaps in the Planning Act, including bills 21 and 25. Can you tell us, I'm just going to stop there, can you tell us uh, whether or not uh, we, we've included bills 21 and 25 here? And their required regulations, I should say. No, they have not been included here. Um, the department's reviewing those bills. They have been um, proclaimed, but they're six and seven years old now. Yeah. So we need to do some work to ensure they're up to date uh, and the new regulations are developed. That will also involve some consultation with municipalities because a lot of uh, those bills that are unproclaimed relate to municipal planning boards. Right. Leader of the Opposition. Great. So I'm, I'm glad that that's on the record. Thank you for that. And also, the, the, the things that we are doing here, of course, are to clarify the purpose of the Act and the Statement of Provincial Interest, and that's very clearly done in this piece of legislation before us. Um, but the last bit of number seven is, and the development of provincial land use policies, and that's the heavy lifting I was just referring to. So can you give us a sense of the time frame as when that portion of recommendation number seven might come forward? 
with that, it is there is a large portion of heavy lifting to, to do with that, and uh, we figured it'll take a minimum two years. Leader of the opposition, two years from today, Minister. Mm -hmm. Goodness, okay. I'm, I'll go on to recommendation number eight then, which says that the provincial government immediately immediately implement province-wide interim regulations to further regulate subdivision and development in areas without an official plan. That's 90 percent of the, of the land use of Prince Edward Island um, until a province-wide land use planning framework is adopted. So that two years will be for that province-wide land use planning framework. Correct. I get that. Correct. So when are we going to see this call for immediate implementation of province-wide interim regulations? The department is looking at that now. Um, the land matters report says notes that it would be a stopgap uh, for until a full use land use plan is developed. So the interim measures are being looked at as to what those will be um, and how we can develop those in addition to the land use plan. And again, the introduction of the statements of provincial interest would be the first step in creating those interim measures that will be in place as well. Leader of the opposition. Thanks. Thanks again, Andrew. But. Um, as we know, statements of interest are not regulations, and they're not, they're, they don't have any binding legislative weight behind them. So, can you give us a sense of how long you feel we're, we're just being told that it'll be two years before we have um, development of province-wide land use policies? How, how soon do you think this call for immediate implementation of, of those interim regulations will be? I, I can't. I don't have a timeline right now. Uh, we're working with the land division to s identify what those interim measures should be, um, recognizing that within the subdivision and development regulations where those interim measures may go, there are the special planning areas that are already in place, um, and we want to make sure that the interim measures are not necessarily identical to those because there have been uh, issues identified with those special planning areas. Um, and we want to be careful in the interim measures that we're not going to completely shut off development. So the land division is working on those. I, I just don't have a timeline as to when they will be ready. Okay. Leader of the opposition. Thanks, Chair. So going back to the two years before we're going to see province-wide provincial land use policies, how long has the department been working on coming forward with these province-wide land, uh, land use policies? Uh, the department is working on them and has been working on them throughout, I believe, the land matters advisory process, maybe not necessarily, you know, land use per policies as in terms of this recommendation, but uh, before that, I, I can't say for certain. It would be a question for the planners in the land division. Leader of the opposition, if we had any. <laughs> and that's, but that's perhaps my next question. And um, I want to start by saying that I've had communications and frequently, actually, with Alex O'Hara, who is currently, I believe, the only person in the department who is uh, specifically designated to do this. And Alex is fantastic. He's a wonderful guy, and he's doing brilliant work. But I do not believe he is a registered land um, planner. Am I correct about that? That's right, but yeah. uh, we're working on getting him there. Right. And uh, uh, by the way, it's not, to my mind, that will not change the quality of the no, work and his expertise yeah, and his intelligence and experience. He's wonderful. Yeah. But is the reason we're going to be two more years, and I, I asked the question of how long we've been at this, and I, I don't know the exact answer for that, but I can tell you it's way more than two years. Mm -hmm. This is something that's been going on for, I think, I can say <laughs> decades. With Probably 50 years. Yes. It should have been you. done 50 years ago. Yes. yes. Thank you. So this is not it's, it's, uh, I guess it's just frustrating because, uh, and by the way, fantastic that we passed the LPA yesterday. Uh, I'm absolutely. really pleased. That's been a long, long time coming. The, the, I agree. It was a big moment. This has been equally torturous, and I guess I'm just disappointed that while we fulfilled with the LPA a number of the really meaningful recommendations from the Land Matters Committee, in doing this, we're really just I wouldn't say it's performative, but we're certainly not dealing with the, the, the meat, the juicy, the central part of, of the changes we need to make with the Planning Act. So I guess my question is, uh, without land use, registered professional planners in the department, how are we going to do this? 
probably that's why we said two years. I mean, we have to be realistic. I could say shorter, but that wouldn't be a realistic timeline with our, our staff we have now. Uh, we are trying to attract more planners to the department, and uh, I, I, I'll say this on record, I'm a big opponent of an island-wide land use plan. I think we need to protect our resource land. It's our only, it's our gold. That's the only thing we have on this island is our resource land, and it needs to be protected with their population growing as fast as it is, our development going fast. We need also need to protect our forestry land. We're losing forest land daily. Uh, I, but, uh, you know, when you look at the report, what's it entitled? Now is the time. Now is the time. So two years, I wish it could be a year, but I, I'm being realistic in saying two years because this, this is a big, big change. It's going to be a big change for Islanders, and but I'm willing to take, take it on. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Chair. As I understand it, actually a lot of this work has been done in the department over those 50 years and perhaps much more recently in the last two or three years, a lot of work was done by the registered professional planners who were in the department at the time to actually accomplish this. So we're not starting from scratch here. No. Um, I, I see that in recommendation number nine, it actually says, and I think they probably were aware of the limited capacity within your department, but if internal planning staff and capacity is not currently sufficient, then the provincial government should obtain external planning support to complete the work. So is that something you plan on doing, Minister, in order to expedite that two-year time frame to something shorter? Sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, sure. So the Recommendation number nine says, well, if you don't have the capacity within your own department, let's go and contract yeah. from professional planners yeah. outside government in order that this can be done. It doesn't say in order that it can be done quickly, yeah. but that's what I'm saying. No, we, and we will, we will take advantage of that if, if, if those planners are available to, um, but definitely we'll take uh, all resources we can. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks. So uh, I'm sure those planners are available in the private sector, and I'm wondering whether your department has budgeted, I mean, maybe we'll see when the operational budget comes in the spring, but have you budgeted to hire private, from the private sector, registered professional planners in order to get this work done? As contract, or you mean uh, we're trying to hire planners within the department now, uh, more planners? Uh, I think we're advertise for two more and uh, and if we need to go outside of government to contract we will leader of the opposition thanks so you know we all know the difficulty in terms of recruiting people to come to PEI whether it's in health or education or in this case in planning and this is a very specific requirement registered professional planners are pretty thin yeah. on the ground so I'm wondering whether you say you have two jobs posted currently? Is that, am I interpreting that correctly? Yeah. I think so. Without <laughs> right. Leader of the Opposition. So do, we, do you have a sense, could you tell the House where we are in terms of people applying for those jobs? I, not, not right at the moment, no. But, uh, I'm sorry, no, I'm not right that. at the moment. No. Sorry, no. Leader of the Opposition. <clears throat> right. Sorry, no, you don't know or no, there is nobody. I, I'm not aware. Okay. I'll have to check with HR. Right. Okay. Leader of the Opposition. So I would hope that in a situation like this where we're doing, as you rightly said, Minister, really critical work um, for the future of this province, that we're not relying on the hope that we will be able to attract registered professional planners will, to the department, but that we're doing both streams simultaneously. We will budget for contracts. Yeah. Fantastic. Leader of the Opposition. Um, is there anybody else on the list here? Uh, no. Oh, okay, right, no. great. I will just keep going then. The number 10, the rec recommendation number 10, that the provincial government reintegrate. This is a sort of, it's a bit wonky, but it's, it's because so much of this um, integrates with municipal affairs uh, through the, through the uh, Municipal Government Act. Governance Act, excuse me, uh, the recommendation here is that we reorganize the department so that all of the land, all of that, all of the people related to land use and land use planning are in the same building. Uh, uh, how long do you think it will take to do that? Uh, we're looking at it right now. Uh, the department started conversations with the Department of Fisheries and Communities, and uh, what the department has heard is that having government planners under one division 
will also help with certification hours to become certified planners um, and will help with recruitment and retention. So we're looking at that. Uh, I believe it will be addressed in the next fiscal year. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the next fiscal year we plan to have that addressed. Leader of the opposition, I said just so I'm clear on that. So you plan on making these departmental changes uh, as recommended in the Land Matters report in the next year? We started the conversations, yes. Yeah. Leader of the opposition. All right. Um, I do have other questions here if there's nobody else on the list. Go Chair. ahead. You with the floor. Great. So can you explain what you're actually trying to achieve with the, with the legislative changes that we have here? Maybe a better way of putting that is, can you explain the differences between the existing bill when it comes to, um, oh gosh, I don't have it in front of me, excuse me, um, the, the provincial interests and uh, the purposes of the act? So maybe in the opposite order, the purpose of this act, how this one differs from the previous act, and also provincial interests, how that they differ. Sure. So um, the, a recommendation from the Land Matters Advisory Committee was that perhaps the current objects of the Act, which is what currently is at Section 2, uh, may not be clear as to what the overall scope of the Act is. So the purposes have been put in place uh, to further outline and clarify what the overall scope of the Act is. And then the addition of statements of provincial interest is brand new. It's not currently in the Act. Leader of the Opposition. Okay, so that, that didn't exist at all. It did not exist at okay. all. No. Right. Okay, Leader of the Opposition. So if I look at sec the new Section 2, 2A, so I'm wondering why the, the municipal level, and that's Clause A, which is copied from the current Act, why, why, we, why we have municipal level in there. There are municipal per planning provisions in the Act. So you would want to make sure that uh, provincial planning and municipal planning work together and are right. efficient. That's the overall scope of the act. Municipal planning is part, I could probably tell you if I looked through it a little bit, uh, part three of the act. Right. Chair of the opposition. Thanks. So I, I, I understand, and I'm actually working currently in my own district with the new municipality of West River who are developing their land use plan, and it's been, been a very positive and inclusive process, I have to say that. Um, and that is a municipality who can create their own bylaws. But of course, we're talking, when it comes to land use planning, as you said earlier, about a lot of the land use being uh, within provincial regulation. And a lot of that is in unincorporated, well, all of that is in unincorporated areas or unincorporated communities. So, and there are indeed incorporated communities that do not have a land use plan. There's many of them. So I'm wondering why you didn't use the word local rather than municipal, because municipal refers, in my mind anyway, to a, a government level which has a land use plan. That's Municipal planning is the term that's just used throughout the Act. Um, that was what's currently in the objects. It wasn't an intentional choice to exclude local governance or local planning, but the word municipal is the term that's used throughout the Act with reference to planning at that level. Leader of the Opposition. So do I take it from that, Andrea, that when we say municipal, we're, we're really talking about local governance, whether that's an incorporated municipality or a municipality with a land plan or without a land use plan? Or... Sorry, I, d I didn't see any definitions. That's why I'm asking this. Right. <clears throat> so municipal under the Act would mean a municipality as defined in the Municipal Government Act. But, and so I don't have, unfortunately, the Municipal Government Act in front of me, but uh, I think when you're talking about municipalities, you're talking about the municipal planning under Part 3 of the Act. Right. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks. So I, uh, I'll pass it on now, uh, Chair, but I, I just want to make a final comment that uh, I am aware of what a huge job this is, but also what an important job this is. And as I said a minute ago, there are we have new municipalities being created which are of sufficient size and capacity in order to develop their own land use plans, but they are very much still in the minority here. We still have a, the vast majority of the land on Prince Edward Island is under provincial control. So I would love to see the department expedite this critical process 
um, so that we so that we have a congruent, cohesive, coherent land use plan from tip to tip because it really representing a rural district as I do, um, I can see where the incompatibility of uses and the lack of forethought has created some real real challenges in terms of delivering services, in terms of building in places where we should not be building. That's a huge, I mean, if you look at what's happening in BC right now, um, we have many heirs of Prince Edward Island that the, the recent report that was tabled by the Minister of uh, Climate Change and Action, uh, Energy and Action, shows where the vulnerable areas on Prince Edward Island are, and there are very many of them, and yet we do not have planning rules in place which are going to prevent islanders from building in places where they're going to get into trouble. Um, so there's, there's a lot of stuff that has to be done here. Again, I really appreciate the work that has been done, Andrea, by yourself and by the department, and I really encourage the minister to, to get her done as, as quickly as we can. Thank Chairman, you, Chair. So. Uh, Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. And I'd like to also say I'm glad to see this first step taken, knowing that there is a long path ahead of us. I know uh, I live in the municipality of Alexandria. It's a rural municipality, and they are working diligently to try to get a land use plan completed for their municipality. So I understand the challenges in doing land use planning in that small area. Um, certainly to do it province-wide for all of the unincorporated area is going to be a huge task. Um, but one that I think Islanders may not even recognize how much we need it, because I think we talk a lot about the Lands Protection Act. We don't recognize that what really some of the key things that we actually are talking about is the Planning Act. Absolutely. And I think that doing the work on this one, um, a lot of that other stuff will kind of take care of itself. But I recognize the work that goes into this and the political will that's going to be required mm -hmm. because this one is not going to be an easy process. It probably won't be appreciated for quite a number of years. Yeah. 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 Mermaid Stratford. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to just ask a couple questions. So on under two, section two purposes for D, um, it has been changed from resolving conflicts respecting land use to encourage cooperation and coordination among stakeholders. So can you just kind of walk me through a little bit why we're removing this reference to conflict resolution? Sorry. Um, we're not removing it. It's um, the one below is to um, address potential conflicts regarding land use. We're just adding an additional one for stakeholders. Okay. Yeah. Right. So there's. Is it, is it, sorry. Sorry. I just yeah. want to like um, what's in the current objects for the most part has been transferred over and we've added a couple more. Okay. Yeah. Mermaid Thank Stratford. So can you just talk to me about the. Um, the, so it's a talk about cooperation and coordination. It seems to be a bit vague. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me what the intent of that of that clause is, and um, what you're trying to accomplish through it? Uh, I think similar to perhaps the efficient planning at a provincial municipal level. There are going to be a lot of stakeholders who are going to be involved in planning development across the province, and you know I, I think it'll be part of the new uh, proposed amendments in the Planning Act to ensure that those stakeholders are heard and coordination is and cooperation is done amongst people with respect to building these land use policies that will work for the island. Mermaid Stratford. Okay, thank you, and so. The current planning system, um, what there is of it, does tend to lead to a lot of conflict, right? Um, and so it seems like it's almost designed to create conflict in a lot of circumstances. So um, particularly in unincorporated area, in unincorporated, sorry, unincorporated areas, um, will, there, will there be any of these changes to help reduce those conflicts or help within the department in order to reduce conflicts? I can't speak to the specific changes now with respect to land use policies. Um, the land use policies will be informed by these changes. 
um, these changes in the statements of provincial interests are put into place uh, as a first step to build these land use policies. So uh, I expect that when you're when these uh, land use policies are being built by the planners, this will be taken into account certainly. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. On the on Island Morning this morning, they. It was, um, a rural, it was a municipality that was talking, and I believe ministers in your district, talking about where you're, they're going to put the solar arrays and putting bylaws in place in order to handle those kinds of things. So in unincorporated areas, that's going on right now, right? If, when you have <coughs> communities and subdivisions developed in unincorporated community and unincorporated subdivisions, uh, owners of property worried about, you know, in my district, solar arrays being p put in and then having, but there's no regulations or anything around that. So when they apply for the building permit, the building permit doesn't get approved, doesn't get denied either, just kind of sits there in limbo for six, seven, eight months um, with no real teeth for um, a constituent to be able to deal with that and to work with their neighbor or whomever it might be to work through a situation like that. We're trying to encourage more of this to happen. I mean, mm -hmm. we have great subsidy programs coming out of the Department of Environment, um, Energy and Climate Action. So how, like, how are, is this first step, knowing that we're two years until we actually get a land use plan, how are we dealing with those things that we, so that islanders can actually get building permits through in this current environment? Um, that, that's a, a good question, and um, it's something we're going to have to deal with right away. And I was just asking Andrea if it would have to be an amendment or a regulation change, and uh, I'll have to find out that. But it's something that definitely uh, I know there's an issue in in your district, and uh, I heard the Island Morning. It's, it's actually the Premier's district. Uh, it's Brackley, oh. so. Um, but yeah, it, it's a it's a concern, and uh, people, uh, yeah, it's something we'll have to look at. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. Because um, as you're aware, in my district, the actual yeah. um, the actual uh, permit from the Department of Environment, uh, Energy, and Climate Action expired like their approval through efficiency PEI actually expired before they even got the building permit to put in that solar array so it is something that's impacting people right now we don't know how long those um, great subsidies are going to have are going to continue but um, you know it's something that municipalities are looking at but in unincorporated areas there's going to be people who aren't going to be able to take advantage of the good um, programs that we're putting out because we don't have our ducks in a row in this area mm -hmm. so I am um, I appreciate that you're going to look into that because I think that that's important and the whole building permit process needs to be reviewed um, so that Islanders aren't waiting like to be able to build in in different areas right mm -hmm. because we know that we have a backlog there a land use so. plan would help that a hundred percent right <laughs> speed up that uh, experience a lot so. Mermaid Stratford. I agree, but we're two years out before we're even close to that, and there's islanders that can't can't wait, you know, to for the two years for us to get this done before they can put in a permit to rebuild a house after a fire, for instance, right? So, um, anyway, so how do you? I'm going to go on. Um, how do you intend for the new statements of provincial interest to be used? So. Will that be to develop government policy or to guide actual land use planning decisions in municipalities? How, what's the intent of them? The initial intent is to help develop the land use policies. The planners have indicated this is the first step in, in developing those land use pol policies and ultimately informing the land use plan. <clears throat> Mermaid Stratford. Okay, thank you. And will these have any immediate impact on the way planning is conducted in the province today or is it only for future? for future use? It's for future use as the land policies get developed. So as land policies get developed, those will impact planning within the uh, province. Okay. Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair, and final question on this. So um, 
It is only so for long term. It's a long term measure. Is there any short term measures that um, we'll be using while we're waiting that two years? And to be honest, it's probably two plus years, right? Like, um, uh, I would You've think just for my me. well, I hope You're not. not. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope not, Minister, because you know we'll be asking certainly well before the two years, but on where we're at, and would hope that there's lots of public consultation that's been going on even as early as you know the next few months that we can get that rolling because the sooner that that public consultation starts the sooner that we'll have an official land use plan for prince edward island and i think we can agree that both of our goals is to have that because it will take a lot of pressure off a lot of islanders especially dealing with neighbors and that kind of thing and, and uh saving our agricultural land like you know as well as i do the levels of speculation happening for our agricultural land and um, and what's happening, like like you said, with force and that kind of thing. So, um, it, I'm happy to, to see that this has started, and I urge you to start the rest of the public consultation as soon as possible, so that we can get the ball rolling on this sooner than later. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair. No Cheryl Town Brighton. Thank you, Chair. I think it's a wonderful thing that we are finally handling uh, land land use planning, which are I and my wife have been calling on for decades, um, and two years sounds like you're going to be using every day of that for, to do the necessary planning. My question is, uh, what is going to happen over that two-year period? Uh, landowners and developers are very smart. Once they hear about this plan, to have the land use plan, are we not going to see a, a rush of of, uh, subdivisions and whatever, eating up substantial uh, laws, right? substantial, substantial over over the next two years. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so again, there there are the interim regulations that was an amendment or a recommendation made by the Land Matters Committee that will operate, or the intention is for them to operate as a stopgap until there is a full land use plan to address that unrestricted development. What those interim measures will look like right now, I don't know. The land division is working, will be working on them. Uh, again, using these statements of provincial interest to inform those regulations. Charlottetown Brighton? It's almost like you should have a moratorium on further development until you actually have the land use pass. Have you considered that? Well, we, we, have, we are going to put the stop uh, gaps in, and uh, there will be the current laws with special planning areas uh, and are doing the job right now, but uh, when we talk to our planning staff, they're pretty eager to get <laughs> a, a, a island-wide land use plan as well and, and make their job a lot better, and there's an, a lot of excitement in the department to do this, so uh, we, will, we will push this along, and uh, I do understand you're concerned about uh, developers, but I, I think we have enough stop gaps there to prevent uh, overdevelopment while we're working on this. Charlottetown Brighton. So uh, we hear a lot of complaints about expensive farmland. Is I don't know for the latest figures. You probably know better than I. Like five or ten thousand dollars an acre. Um, but that's peanuts when you look at the what you get for a buildable house lot. How are you gonna? How are you going to deal with a farmer who is telling that he can't convert his agricultural land into building lots, type of thing? That That is going to be the challenge. Mm -hmm. it is, it, I think we have to come up with a balanced approach. Uh, a lot of farmers use their land as a retirement uh, retirement investments, and uh, you know that's a legitimate uh, situation. Uh, but with the land, agricultural land value increasing, it's coming, the, the gap isn't is quite as large now. So I think with um, the Minister of Environment's report and this report and other reports, the land use reports, I think islanders are, and farmers will be pretty accepting to protect their, their own resource land for the next generation. And, uh, I'm hoping that uh, it won't be as hard as uh, we might think it might be. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Good. Any further questions? Sure. Shall the bill carry? Carry. Sure. 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 
Chair Hicks. I had questions from yesterday, answers okay. to bring that. So you're, ta you're tabling those? Yeah. Or? Okay. I can't reach you. I I move the title. An act to amend the planning act number two, shall it carry? Carry. I move the enacting clause. Be it enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Pro Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Carry. Mr. Chair, I move the speaker take the chair and the chair report the bill agreed to without amendment. Shall it carry? Mr. Speaker, as chair of a committee of the whole House, having had under consideration a bill to be intituled an act to amend the Planning Act number two, I beg leave to report that the committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to same without amendment. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Shall I carry? The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move second by the member from Moraldona that the first order of the day be now read. Shaw Carey. Carey. Order number one, consideration of the capital estimates in committee. Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move second by the member from Moraldona that this House do now resolve itself into a committee, the whole House, to take into consideration grant of capital supply to Her Majesty. Shaw Carey. Carey. The Honourable Member from Monaco Kilmuir to Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please. The House is now in a committee of the whole House to take to consider the grant of capital supply to Her Majesty. Stranger. Stranger. Permission has been asked to take a stranger on the floor. Granted.
Could you state your name and title for Hansard, please? Uh, Gordon McFadden, Assistant Secretary to Treasury Board. Thank you. Uh, members, we're on page 19 right now, uh, Capital Expenditure Health PEI. Uh, I'm just going to open it up to questions. Morales, Mermaid Stratford. Thanks, Chair. Um, I don't necessarily have a question. I would just like to um, just like to make a just a quick quick statement. And first of all, I want to um, say thank you for working on bringing all of the information back that you have because I know that um, departments have worked long and hard in order to bring that information. And so that for that, I appreciate. And Minister, I do plan to support the budget, and I plan to support the budget because. I recognize that health care of Prince Edward Island needs, um, needs us to really make changes in order for Islanders to benefit from our health care system. And I'm hoping that the changes that we do approve here will be the first step in order to help us get there, knowing that on the operational side we have a whole lot of work to do. And I am supporting as well because of this Stratford High School. and. Um, recognizing that uh, my constituents hope that we stick to the timeline of fall of 2025 to open that. So I just wanted to recognize that I know that there was a lot of work done and I do have good, I have a lot of hopes for what this budget can bring and I hope that that comes to fruition. <laughs> so I don't have anything else to say but I wanted to make that statement. Thank, Thank you. Minister. Any further questions, mm -hmm. members? Shall the section carry? Carry. Total capital expenditure, health PEI, 54,154,600. Shall it carry? Carry. Shall the capital budget carry? Carry. Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the Chair and that the Chair uh, make report to Mr. Speaker. Ella Carey. Carey. Mr. Mr. Speaker, as chair of a committee of the whole House, I wish to report that the committee has gone into capital supply to be granted to Her Majesty and has come to certain resolutions thereon, which said re resolutions I am directed to report to this House whenever it should be pleased to receive same. Mr. Speaker, I move second by the Honorable Premier uh, that the report of the committee be received. Shall I carry? I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Shall I carry? <laughs> the Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm the second by the Honorable Premier that the second order of the day be now read. Shall I carry? carry. Order number two, consideration of the supplementary estimates in committee. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to seconded by the Honourable Premier that this House do now resolve itself in the of the whole House to take into consideration grant of supply to Her Majesty. Sure, Carey. Carey. Yeah. The Honourable Member from uh, Monaco, Kilmuir, and the Government Whip to chair the Committee of the Whole, please.
The House is now in a committee of the whole House to consider the grant of supplement, supplementary supply to Her Majesty. Uh, do you have a, we have a request to bring a stranger on the floor. Shall it be granted? State your name and title for Hansard for the 15th time. <laughs> Gordon Fadgen, Assistant Secretary of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Gordon. Is it the pleasure of the committee that we open it up to general questions or do we want to go schedule by schedule? Schedule by schedule? Okay. So page seven is where we'll start. Transporta transportation, infrastructure, and energy to fund year-end accounting and adjustments primarily related to the capitalization of a long-term lease. 6,793,900. Questions? Uh, Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Um, could you uh, provide uh, the information on what long-term lease this is referring to? Um, it's for the uh, Garfield Street lease for Health PEI's building. Uh, Charlottetown Belvedere. Garfield Street Health PEI. They have an administrative building at Garfield Street, 16 Garfield Street to be specific. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, and so what's the period of the lease? Um, that it, it's been many years. Um, they've been in that location for um, as long as I as long as I can remember, so over ten years for sure. Charlottetown Belvedere. So to be clear, this is this is an accounting adjustment. To, because you're capitalizing that lease after the end of the term, maybe? Uh, no, sure. Um, what happened in this particular instance when uh, government went to renew uh, the lease at Garfield Street for the next period, probably a 10-year period, um, the Auditor General had determined that um, based on the length of the lease and, and the value that we had paid uh, for the building, it, it would turn it more into a capital uh, lease than an operating lease, and um, when uh, when a lease has been switched from cap from operating to capital, you essentially have to uh, capitalize the whole value of all the periods and amortize the payments of it every year. So it gets to the same place at the end, but we didn't have a budget for the capitalization of the lease accounted for in the capital budget when the accounting adjustment arose. Um, so, uh, again, it, it, it is definitely an accounting um, exercise that mm -hmm. gets the lease to the same place at the end of the lease. Yeah. yeah and Charlottetown I, Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. And I know we've spoken, you know, in other circumstances in, in PAC and other committees about, about the supplementary um, uh, special warrants. And so, you know, when you know that you're going to have a capitalization coming, I'm just kind of really confused why it needs to be done with a special warrant. Like, it's not like it's a surprise, <laughs> you know, the building wasn't a surprise and the capitalization requirement wasn't. So how, is that the only mechanism you've got to do this accounting adjustment? Um, to, to be fair, this, this was um, the 1920 fiscal year, so that was the late year as a result of COVID in January. Right. Um, so it was through discussions with the department and the Office of the Auditor General um, to arrive at the opinion and the accounting um, um, treatment for that particular lease. Um, and then when that was determined, um, we didn't have sufficient funds in the capital budget for 1920s to, uh, to cover these, these costs. So that was their only vehicle available was a special warrant. Okay. No, that, that makes sense. So yeah, I'm, I'm good with that. Thank you. Leader of the third party. Is this something you could see happen with other uh, rental properties? Um, as a result of this particular transaction, um, I know the Office of the Comptroller is reviewing the leases and the building leases of government, in particular with the Department of uh, Transportation and Infrastructure who hold the leases for government, mm -hmm. to go through a lease-by-lease -lease kind of determination to as to whether or not other leases will qualify as, as capital. So it's ongoing for sure. So just, sorry, Chair. Oh, sorry, leader of the third party. Thank you. So just, just for to be clear, so this, it has to be go under a special warrant because it's money you hadn't anticipated spending. Is that correct? 
uh, we would have anticipated spending it in the operating budget. Mm -hmm. So we would have had sufficient room in the operating budget to pay the annual lease costs. Right. Um, but when they have to capitalize it, they have to take the full value of the lease, recognize it as a capital asset, charge it to the capital budget, and then depreciate it every year after that. Okay. Okay. Um, so, like, we would have had the cost, but just not capitalized on okay. that. So we're not sure if it could happen again in another month or not. <laughs> uh, generally, we're, we're through sort of the 2021 audit, and no leases, I believe, came up during that time. Okay. So, but that doesn't mean that they won't arrive at another one when we go to renew another lease in another building. So that's the criteria that the department is looking at now. Um, and they're starting to do their planning as a result of that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Any further questions on this okay. schedule? Shall this schedule carry? Okay. Shall the schedule carry? Okay. All right. Members, page 11. Economic growth, tourism, and culture, capital, to fund expenditures related to work completed on the Alpine and Nordic venues to be used in the 2023 Canada Games, 455800 Shall the section Sorry, Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. Um, can you explain why this um, work, which again was planned and has been announced and announced, uh, why did this have to be done through a special warrant as well? Was it not budgeted? Um, yes, the, the project w was known. Um, the speed of which the work was going to get done um, was um, not quite known. Um, so when the capital budget for 2020-2021 was debated in the fall of 2019. Um, they didn't think they would be this far along on this particular project, so they hadn't set up enough in that particular year for this particular project. Charlottetown Belvedere. Has that planning challenge been addressed with future cost out of our um, expenditures, planned expenditures? Are we going to see this again, or is it covered now? For this particular project? Well, just in general, you've got yes. other Canada Games expenditures. Yes. Are we are we planning to have them in the right budget cycle, or are we going to see special warrants for those too? Uh, no, I, I think through through the debate of the capital budget, I think departments um, that that have capital programs that do the work, the best work that they can, to first and foremost try to establish a budget that's appropriate for the particular project. And then the next challenge is to try to allocate within each fiscal year, if it's a multi-year project, uh, the, the expected cash flow for that particular project. Um, from time to time, the, the, the speed of which the, the cash flow happens does um, does change. And, and we've seen that through the debate of the capital budget, that the forecasts for the current year are, are different than the budget, and, and that's just part of the budgeting process. Charlottetown Belvedere. Sure. Can you explain how there's a revenue offset on this? I'm not really clear why we have a revenue offset showing um, up against capital when we don't have it in anything else for the capital budget. Uh, the revenue offset would go to the operating fund, but um, for this particular special warrant, when the department came for their um, budget for the year 2020-21, there was also a small amount uh, related to um, some golf carts that they were trading in. And the next purchase had a, a trade-in value for the ones that we kind of um, kind of replaced, and so they they needed a small special warrant for the revenue offset of the uh, trade-ins from the golf carts. Charlottetown Belvedere. So it's not specifically related to the Canada Games expenditure. It's just it's a special it's a special warrant that occurred within the same department, but right. The majority of which majority. related to Canada Games for sure. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you. It's just, it just feels a little, little unusual, but I recognize yep. it, it's the, the process of, of, of accounting again. So the, cur the current is a separate section, Chair, is that Chair? Is Sorry. The current, the current expenditures are a separate section? Sorry, or I it's hard. Within this schedule, there's the capital expenditures and then there's current expenditures. Are we, can I ask questions on the current expenditures too, or do you have somebody else on your list? You're the only one right now. I'm the only one. Well, that's just great. Um, tourism PEI, 1.25. 1.25 million um, to fund additional expenditures to assist tourism operators in industry during the COVID pandemic. Um, are these are these covered within the um, the um, 
but the audit that is being done separately as a, as a special expenditure, like obviously this is coming in as a special warrant. We did have obviously some very extensive work on reporting on COVID expenditures already, but just wondering if this is a additional beyond the ones that we've already had reported or how does this fit in because it's coming in as a special warrant rather than... Uh, again, um, th this is related to the fiscal year ended 2020 2021. Yeah. Um, there was um, a, um, an expenditure for the department which was fully offset by revenue for related to uh, tourism activities for the department. Um, so this is the mechanism that w we have to bring when the department is in excess of, of their budget. Um, whether or not this gets picked up by the AG in his second mm -hmm. phase of the audit, I, I'm, I'm not aware specifically. Um, it wasn't picked up in the first phase, for sure. Yeah. Um, sorry, remember, you're asking questions under tourism PEI now, right? Yeah, that's yeah, sorry. sorry. I wasn't clear on what I was asking I, about. If I, I was confused. It's general on so, the schedule or, yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm just going to go back. Can we carry the first, shall the first section carry members? Yes. Carry. carry. Okay. Tourism PEI, to fund additional expenditures to assist tourism operators and the industry during the COVID-19 pandemic, one one million two hundred and fifty thousand. Charlottetown Belvedere. <laughs> I started to preempt you there, Chair. Um, I appreciate the, again, the accounting that happens with sort of the, the shift of, of special warrant back and forth, but, um, you know, I'm wondering, does this mean that this was a, pro a new program that wasn't originally in scope with the funds that were allocated, you know, that came primarily from the federal government and then were put into the special COVID funds? Is this an, a new program that we needed to move money from one to another to cover for it? Could you tell me what the program was for this special warrant? Um... For this particular program, Tourism PEI partnered with ACOA uh, to execute a local marketing campaign to support the tourism industry. So ACOA came with some funds for us to participate in um, and we accepted those funds. We didn't have a program set, a, set up for it at the time, so right. hence the, 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 the expenditure budget was not sufficient um, for the department but it was fully offset by revenue, so on a net basis for government, uh, it was at no cost, additional cost. Charlottetown Belvedere? But the revenue in that case was from another federal body. It would have been revenue from ACOA. Correct. Charlottetown Belvedere? Okay. In the, in the NGO sector, that's called double dipping. So uh, it's good to see it's a zero line, but um, you know, hopefully that will show up in our, in our audit later on. Um, I'm good there for now. Thank you. On that Any further questions on this section? Shall the section carry? Questions on employee benefits and health Yeah, I'm going okay. to that one next. Shall the section carry? Carry. Employee benefits to fund expenditures related to increases in workers' compensation and vacation leave costs, five million four hundred and eleven thousand three hundred. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. You preempted me. You knew I was going to ask. Um, can you? Um, is there any breakdown between the, co the workers' compensation expenditures and the vacation leave expenditures? Um, the, the lion's share of the expenses in the section, 5.1 million related to um, the um, increase in workers' compensation costs. Um, and what that was was a one-time increase to the liability for um, the cancer legislation that came in for firefighters. Right. So the firefighters, um, um, the WC legislation um, expanded to include certain cancers. Um, so when it came, uh, the province is on, on responsible for those costs to pay out the benefits to workers' comp uh, under that program. So the actuaries had worked with what they expect that to cost over the long haul. So we had a one-time um, hit, if you might call it, for the increase to that workers' comp liability for the cost related to, to the firefighters. Charlottetown Belvedere. No, that's a, that's a worthy cost. That's good. Thank you for that. Good. Shall the section carry? Yeah. Shall the schedule carry? Yeah. Hey, well, 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 oh. Health and wellness. Next page. Yeah, that's what I'm going to next. Uh, same schedule. Oh, okay. I thought you said the schedule. Yes. Same schedule. Yeah. No, it's okay. Health and wellness. To fund additional expenditures incurred due to increased federal funding received. 2469600 Mermaids. Yeah. Mermaid Stratford. Sure. So this, the description on this one says that it's because of money that we got from the federal government. Can you tell me, um, was this additional funding that was requested by our province? 
Um, for this, this particular program, um, this was um, a sport organization, so the federal government came with a, a program for all provinces, of which we uh, received um, well, the 2.6 million that is revenue offset that we kind of distributed out to all the sport organizations across PEI. Okay. So again, similarly, the federal government came with a program, we, we signed an agreement with them, collected the revenue, and then had to uh, make the expenditures on that, for which we had no budget, hence a special warrant. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Shall the schedule carry? All right, page 16, members. Transportation and infrastructure capital to fund additional capital costs for highway construction, bridges, provincial paving, and active transportation, 20700000 Questions? Uh, Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Well, 20... <laughs> what can I say? Oh, it's highway construction, bridges, provincial paving, oh, and active transportation. Could you tell me how much of $20.7 million is for active transportation, please? $7.8 million. $7.8 million. Well, that's refreshing. Um, we have a revenue offset of $6.2 million. Could you advise what that comes in at? Um, sure. Um, we, we had discussed this during the capital budget debate um, when we were talking about the forecast because this is for the current fiscal year, 2021-22. Right. Um, so um, we did, um, through the gas tax, uh, National uh, Build Canada Fund and ICIP, we're able to push forward some priority projects um, at, a, at a faster pace than we had initially budgeted. And therefore, we were able to uh, claim the offsetting revenue under those revenue streams to uh, to uh, reflect the work. Charlottetown Belvedere. So we accelerated projects with a greater upfront investment, which allowed us to then claim back some of the potential offsets from those various funds in the same fiscal year. Yes. Sure. Counting this year must have been just an absolute joy. <laughs> Every year. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Understatement of the century. Um, I mean, I know you. I know I'm trying to be, trying to not be facetious, but it's very difficult because it's been a very long day. Um, how do you budget an extra twenty million dollars in, in, uh, in spending above what was already budgeted? Like, how how can we budget that much be off that much? Like, is it just that the, there was the money was made available and we couldn't say no, or it's a large to be off. And I appreciate that eight million of it is almost as inactive transportation, great, but it's twenty million, twenty one million dollars. Um, <laughs> so within the three buckets there was nine million in bridges, uh, seven million for paving and, and almost eight million or seven point eight million in active transportation. Um, and when the active transportation program went out um, and, and again we had discussed this during the, the capital uh, budget uh, discussions, um, there was a, a tremendous uptake and in interest in that. Um, I think there was a one-time um, availability to get that on the docket for uh, this year. Yep. Um, so we took that opportunity, the government took that opportunity um, and kind of advanced that program faster than the budget we had available for it. Cheryl Tab Belvedere. I'm good, Chair. Thank you. Shall the section carry? Oh, leader of the opposition. Yeah, just a quick question. The revenue offset, and I apologize if this was asked, but does that apply to all three of those uh, different pots you talked about, uh, Gordon? All, all three of those would have revenue revenue offsets. Could you give us a breakdown of that? I, I don't have the specific breakdown for each one. Okay. In that case, good. Fine. Shall the section carry? Carry. carry. General Government to fund additional expenditures from the COVID-19 response and recovery contingency, 15 million. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. Is this 15 million going to be again part of the audit that we've requested um, through the AG? I think the AG has indicated that he is auditing all COVID expenses, so I, I suspect so, but I can't confirm his, his plans one way or another. So I'd expect to see a breakdown of those expenditures through that, that function. Um, I know in the 2020-2021 financial statements there was a fairly detailed accounting of the COVID expenditures. Mm -hmm. yeah. I expect the same to happen for the current fiscal year. So um, as was indicated in the operating budget, $50 million was set up 
for ongoing program expenses re that were coming up as a re result of COVID. Um, we found prior, well, as of September, we were getting close to the, the ceiling of what departments were hoping to, to provide. So um, we decided to uh, ask for a little more money to keep the programs open and available, and that's what the special warrant is for. Yeah. Charles Tab Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate the, the incredible level of work and complexity of this disease files, especially given the, the complexity of the times that we've been in and your patience with the process and with the, the, the questions that we need to ask on behalf of our constituents. Um, I have no further questions, Chair. Uh, thank you, Honourable Member, and I, I appreciate that you understand that, you know, it's been an unbelievable year for the Department and, you know, they've done uh, so much work to get us to where we're at and, uh, uh, yeah, thank you for recognizing. Yep, thank you. Yeah. Shall the section? Shall the schedule carry? Carry. Total special warrants, 35 million seven hundred thousand. Shall it carry? Carry. Shall the supplementary supplementary estimates carry? Carry. That's right. That's right. I should take this out in the house. Pay rate. Don't watch. Don't worry. Don't watch. Don't watch. Okay. Mr. Chair, I move the speaker take the chair and that the chair make their make report to Mr. Speaker. Shall it carry? Mr. Speaker, as chair of a committee of the whole House, I wish to report that the committee has gone into supplementary supply to be granted to Her Majesty and has come to certain resolutions thereon, which said resolutions I am directed to report to the House whenever it should be, be pleased to receive same. Mr. Speaker, I move second by the Honourable Premier that the report of the committee be now received. So carry. Mr. Speaker, I move that the report of the committee be now adopted. So carry. Carry, right. No. Oh. <laughs> you know. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move second by the Honourable Premier that the 24th order of the day be now read. So carry. carry. Order 24, Appropriation Act, Capital Expenditures, 2022, Bill Number 40, ordered for second reading. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Honourable Premier that the said bill be read a second time. Sure, Carrie. Carrie. Bill 40, Appropriation Act, Capital Expenditures, 2022, read a second time. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I move second by the Honourable Premier that this House do now resolve itself in the Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration a grant of supply to Her Majesty. Sure, Carrie. Carrie. The Honourable Member from Monaco, Kilmore, the Government Whip, to Chair of the Committee of the Whole, please.
The House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intitled Appropriation Act, Capital Expenditures 2022. Stranger? Yes. We have a uh, request to bring a stranger on the floor. Shall it be granted? State your name and title for answer, please. Gordon McFadgen, Assistant Secretary of the Treasury Board. Thank you. Is it the pleasure of the committee that we just open up to general questions? Yes, All right. Questions? Carry. Shall the bill carry? Carry. <coughs> Shall the schedule carry? Carry. One more time. Okay, yep, one more time. Appropriation Act, Cap Capital Expenditures 2022. Shall it carry? I move the enacting clause. May it please your honor, we, Her Majesty's dutiful and loyal servants, the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island, towards appropriating the several supplies raised for the exigencies of Her Majesty's government and for the, for other, for the other purposes here and after mentioned, do humbly beseech that it be enacted. Be it therefore enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Carry. Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the Chair and the Chair report the bill and read to without amendment. Shall it carry? Carry. Jeez, help it. Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having had under consideration a bill to be intitled Appropriation Act, Capital Expenditures 2022, I beg leave to report that the Committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to same without amendment. I move that the report of the Committee be adopted. Shall I carry? Standing vote. Honorable Members, it's a standing vote has been called. Honorable Members? <laughs> Couldn't point here. Sergeant Arms, you may ring the bell. Speaker, government is ready for the vote. Is everyone ready for the vote? Yes. Yes. Honorable members, those voting against, please stand. The honorable member from Charlottetown West Royalty, the honorable leader of the official opposition, the honorable member, member from Summerside Wilmot, the, honor, the honorable member from Charlottetown Victoria Park, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown Belvedere, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown Brighton, the Honourable Member from Tyne Valley Sherbrooke, and the Honourable Member from Summerside South Drive. Did anyone voting for, please stand. <coughs> The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities, the Honourable Member from Morel Dona, the Honourable <coughs> Minister of Finance and Deputy Premier, the Honourable Premier, the Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy, Climate Action, the Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown Winslow, 
the Honorable Member from Montague Kilmuir, the Honorable Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning, the Honorable Minister of Agriculture and Land and the Minister of Justice and Public Safety, the Honorable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture, the Honorable Minister of Social Development and Housing, and the Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness, the Honorable Leader of the Third Party, and the Honorable Leader, or pardon me, the Honorable Member from Mermaid, Mermaid Stratford. Honorable members, it's passed. The Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move second by the Honorable Premier that the 25th order of the day be now read. Sure, Carrie. Carrie, Carrie. Order 25, Supplementary Appropriation Act Number 2, 2021, Bill Number 41, ordered for second reading. Donald Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Honorable Premier that the said bill be read a second time. Sure, Karen. Bill number 41, Supplementary Appropriation Act number 2, 2021, read a second time. The Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Honorable Premier that this House do now resolve itself in the Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration said bill. Sure, Kerry. The Honorable Member from Monaco Kilmuir, the Government. Whip to chair the committee of the whole house, please. The House is now in a committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be entitled Supplementary Appropriation Act No. 2, 2021. Stranger? Do we have a request to bring a stranger on the floor? Shall it be granted? Could you state your name and title for answer, please? Uh, Gordon McFadgen, Assistant Secretary to the Treasury Board. Thank you. Do we want to open up to general questions, members, or <coughs> general questions? Shall the bill carry? Carry. Shall Schedule A carry? Carry. Shall Schedule B carry? Carry. Shall Schedule C carry? Carry. Title. Supplementary Appropriation Act Number 2, 2021. Shall it carry? Yeah. Under the enacting clause. May it please your honor, be it therefore enacted by, by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Yeah. Mr. Chair, I the Speaker take the chair and the Chair report the bill agreed to without amendment. Shall it carry? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, as, a cha as chair of a committee of the whole House, having had under consideration a bill to be entitled Supplementary Appropriation Act Number 2, 2021, I beg leave to report that the committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to same without amendment. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Shut up, Karen.
pizza. Just uh, came. You said there was enough for everybody. It looks like there's just enough for you. The Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move that uh, orders 3, 6, okay. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 26, 27, 24, 25, and uh, for third reading and unanimous consent for the ones that are necessary. <coughs> Excuse me. Honorable members, does she have your unanimous consent? Honourable Minister, you have unanimous consent. Order number three, an act to amend the Liquor Control Act Bill number 15, ordered for third reading. Order number six, an act to amend the Employment Standards Act number two, Bill number 22, ordered for third reading. Order number seven, an act to amend the Highway Traffic Act Bill number 23, ordered for third reading. Order number eight, an act to amend the Winter Wellness Day Act, Bill number 31, ordered for third reading. Order number nine, an act to amend the Highway Traffic Act, number two, Bill number 24, ordered for third reading. Order number 10, an act to amend the Employment Standards Act, number three, Bill number 34, ordered for third reading. Order number 11, an act to amend the Workers' Compensation Act, Bill number 25, ordered for third reading. Order number 12, an act to amend the Summary Proceedings Act, Bill number 26, ordered for third reading. Order number 13, Access to Digital Assets Act, Bill number 27, ordered for third reading. Order number 14, an act to amend the Statutes of Limitations, <coughs> Bill number 28, ordered for third reading. Order number 15, an act to amend the Business Corporations Act, Bill number 29, ordered for third reading. Order number 16, Class Proceedings Act, Bill number 36, ordered for third reading. Order number 17, an act to repeal the Dental Profession Act, Bill number 33, ordered for third reading. Order 18, an act to amend the Trails Act, Bill number 35, ordered for third reading. Order 19, Pension, tra Pension Plan Transfer Act, Bill number 30, ordered for third reading. Order number 20, Loan Act 2021, Bill number 32, ordered for third reading. Order 21, an act to amend the Income Tax Act, Bill number 37, ordered for third reading. Order 22, an act to amend the Community Development Equity Tax Credit Act, Bill number 38, ordered for third reading. Order 23, Health Professions Amendment Act, Bill number 39, ordered for third reading. Order 24, Appropriation Act Capital Expenditures 2022, Bill number 40, ordered for third reading. Order 25, Supplementary Appropriation Act, number 2, 2021, Bill number 41, ordered for third reading. Order 26, an act to amend the Prince Edward Island Land Protection Act, number 2, Bill number 42, ordered for third reading. Order 27, an act to amend the Planning Act, number 2, Bill number 43, ordered for third reading. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Honourable Premier that the said bills be read a third time. Sure, I care. Very good. Right. <coughs> Bill number 15, an act to amend the Liquor Control Act, read a third time. Bill number 22, an act to amend the Employment Standards Act, number 2, read a third time. Bill number 23, an act to amend the Highway Traffic Act, read a third time. Bill 31, an act to amend the Winter Wellness Day Act, read a third time. Bill number 24, an act to amend the Highway Traffic Act, number two, read a third time. Bill number 34, an act to amend the Employment Standards Act, number three, read a third time. Bill number 25, an act to amend the Workers' Compensation Act, read a third time. Bill number 26, an act to amend the Summary Proceedings Act, read a third time. Bill number 27, Access to Digital Assets Act, read a third time. Bill number 28, an act to amend the statute, statutes of limitations, read a third time. Bill number 29, an act to amend the Business Corporations Act, read a third time. Bill number 36, Class Proceedings Act, read a third time. Bill number 33, an act to repeal the Dental Profession Act, read a third time. Bill number 35, an act to amend the Trails Act, read a third time. Bill number 30, Pension Plan, Tra Pension Plan Transfer Act, read a third time. 
Bill number 32, Loan Act 2021, read a third time. Bill number 37, an act to amend the Income Tax Act, read a third time. Bill number 38, an act to amend the Community Development Equity Tax Credit Act, read a third time. Bill number 39, Health Professions Amendment Act, read a third time. Bill number 40, Appropriation Act Capital Expenditures 2022, read a third time. Bill number 41, a Supplementary Appropriation Act number 2, 2021, read a third time. Bill number 42, an act to amend the Prince Edward Island Lands Protection Act number 2, read a third time. Bill number 43, an act to amend the Planning Act number 2, read a third time. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy <coughs> Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move second by the Honourable Premier that the said bills do now pass. Shh. Honourable Members, these are bills introduced by the Leader of the House. Read a first time, read a second time, committed to the Committee of the Whole House. Reported, agreed to, with, and without amendment. As the case may be, read a third time and is now moved, but the bills do now pass. All those in favor say yay. 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 Contrary, nay. Honorable Minister, your bills passed unanimously. Yay. Honorable members, I've been advised that the Honorable. Oh, sorry. Wait your turn, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> the Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. I wish to advise the House that this includes business that government Pizza. Uh, wishes to conduct during this fall sitting of 2021. Shall I care? Honorable members, I wish to advise that concludes the business the government wished to conduct during this fall. Oh, sorry, that's Minister of Finance. <laughs> <laughs> Supper's well, waiting. <laughs> it's been a long day, there, sir. Honorable members, I've been advised that the Lieutenant Government Governor it will be arriving at the George Coles Building shortly. I will now leave the chair and invite her, the honor, the Lieutenant Governor, to join us in the chamber to receive the House and to grant royal assent to the various bills passed by the House. Your Honor, the 
Legislative Assembly has passed certain bills during this, the second session of the 66th General Assembly, and now begs your honours consideration of the grant of royal assent for the following bills. An Act to amend the Liquor Control Act, Bill Number 15. An Act to amend the Employment Standards Act, Number 2, Bill Number 22. An Act to amend the Highway Traffic Act, Bill Number 23. An Act to amend the Highway Traffic Act, Number 2, Bill Number 24. An Act to amend the Workers' Compensation Act, Bill Number 25. An Act to amend the Summary Proceedings Act, Bill Number 26. Access to Digital Assets Act, Bill Number 27. An Act to amend the Statutes of, Limit Statutes of Limitations, Bill Number 28. An Act to amend the Business Corporations Act, Bill Number 29. Pension Plan Transfer Act, Bill Number 30. An Act to amend the Winter Wellness Day Act, Bill Number 31. Loan Act 2021, Bill Number 32. An Act to repeal the Dental Professions Act, Bill Number 33. An Act to amend the Employment Standards Act, Number 3, Bill Number 34. An Act to amend the Trails Act, Bill Number 35. Class Proceedings Act, Bill Number 36. An Act to amend the Income Tax Act, Bill Number 37. An Act to amend the Community Development Equity Tax Credit Act, Bill Number 38. Health Professions Amendment Act, Bill Number 39. Supplementary Appropriation Act Number 2, 2021, Bill Number 41. An Act to amend the Prince Edward Island Land Protection Act Number 2, Bill Number 42. An Act to amend the Planning Act Number 2, Bill Number 43. An Act to amend the Water Act, Bill 116. Non-Disclosure Agreement Act, Bill Number 118. An Act to amend the Employment Standards Act, Bill Number 119. An Act to amend the Rental of Residential Property Act, Bill Number 122. Thank you. Please be seated. In Her Majesty's name, I assent to these bills. May it please Your Honour, we, Her Majesty, loyal and dutiful subjects of the Legislative Assembly of Prince Edward Island, in session assembled, approach Your Honour to the close of our labours with sentiments of the unified devotions and loyalty to Her Majesty, persons and government. We do humbly beg of you for Your Honour's acceptance of the following bills and titles. Appropriation Act 2022, thus placing at the disposal of the Crown the means by which government can be made efficient for the service and welfare of the province. Her Honor, the Honorable Lieutenant Governor doth thank Her Majesty's loyal and dutiful subjects, accepts her benevolence and assents to this bill in Her Majesty's name. Thank you. Please, please be seated. Um, I am so impressed with the amount of work that we've been able to um, carry on with this pandemic. To me, it's a sign that we are, in fact, in a real renewal phase. And I thank you for all your hard labors um, in this second session of the 66th General Assembly of Prince Edward Island. Je tiens à vous exprimer ma reconnaissance pour votre dévouement au bien-être des insulaires, surtout face aux défis présentés pendant cette période de renouvellement de la pandémie et du redressement économique que nous vivons actuellement. On behalf of all Islanders, I wish to express to all of you my most sincere gratitude and appreciation for your leadership and care in guiding us and helping us to deal with the challenges of this pandemic, especially the protection of our health and the recovery of our economy. At this time, I pray that until the Legislative Assembly again meets, each of you enjoy good health and prosperity and that peace and freedom for all people be more nearly achieved. And thank you so much for your labels. Heartfelt thanks. Thank you. Thank you. 
Honourable Member from Morrell, Dona, and the Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by the Honourable Premier, that this House do adjourn until the call of you, the Speaker. Honourable Member, before I uh, call the question, just I just want everybody, and I know it's not easy, but everybody to go home, take some time for yourself, knowing. I play the part too, like you just can't go home and take the time for yourself, but you had a good sitting, uh, you got a lot of work done, and you deserve some time with yourselves and your families. And uh, make sure you do that. Uh, we've seen the events that happened over the last week on our highways, and uh, so just go home and spend time with your family. Just take a day or two days or whatever it is and, uh, and, and, and just do that. I know it's hard because of the line of work we're in, but I don't want to hold everybody up because we're uh, over down, We're in the second overtime period right now. So, shall it carry? Carries. See you next spring. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's quick. <laughs>